Is Belichick going to catch Shula? I, I never thought this was going to happen. I think he's going to catch Shula. He needs like three eight-win seasons. Yep. Yeah, it looks like he's well on his way to at least getting one of them. Uh, although, I think he's uh, like 24 or something like that behind yes. Don Shula. All-time yes. victories. Wow. There was a time years ago when people would ask that question, is anybody ever going to break Don Shula's record? And I thought, no way, that uh, nobody would be in the game long enough. Uh, but Belichick, uh, he seems determined. I think even if he is deceased, he will retain... <laughs> through some kind of bizarre arrangement with Bob Kraft, who's uh, inclined to get involved in bizarre arrangements, as evidenced by his visit to the Asian spa. But I would imagine he, he would be inclined to go ahead and, uh, you know, be, be in a condoning position of uh, Belichick still coaching the team while deceased so that he could eclipse the Shula record. What Would they count that, or does that get an asterisk if you're dead <laughs> when you pass dead. the record? <laughs> Finally, there's a reason for an asterisk. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good to be with you here. The time. Wake up with Defo, joined by Luby. Welcome to the Defo Show. And a very special good morning, uh, everybody. Good to be with you. Good to be back with you here on the Defo Show on South Florida Live. Jeff DeForest and one Mike Luby Lubitz, the moving man who, um, you know, people naturally, they, they start to question whether I'm still alive if I disappear from what appeared uh, or seemed to be a scheduled show. Most people are expecting us to show up on a Monday because it's kind of a big day here in uh, South Florida sports since we almost only in, in South Florida concern ourselves with football and we're... <laughs> Right in the midst of the uh, football season coming down the pike there in the uh, college football season and the NFL season is uh, somewhere around the midway point, uh, maybe just short of it a little bit since we now play 100 games uh, in the uh, National Football League. There's games on all the time. But, uh, yeah, we, we're gone. And, of course, I start getting the usual texts and uh, messages, uh, various uh, forms of communication, uh, Facebook, social media. Are you alive, Defo? Are you alive? That's the first question. Are you live? And once I answer that, they say, okay, and then we'll figure you're going to be doing a show again soon. But um, yesterday, did you take care of all of your business uh, yesterday? Because uh, we blew off a couple of shows yesterday. And uh, Luby, you're still in the same situation there. What do you have? No Wi-Fi at the new house? What's going on? Uh, we're As I've said repeatedly, so like you listen as well as my wife does, um, we're going to be doing work on the new house. So there's I can't really get there yet, but at least it's purchased. It's ours. We celebrated Halloween last night with my nephews and my parents there, which was super cool. It's it's funny because we've been in the townhouse the last like four years. So like the first year we got super excited for Halloween and we bought candy and we were ready and no one came by. Nobody. Yeah. This neighborhood is like old school. It's like when I was growing up, like my parents brought like a bag of candy. I figured it'd be enough. We almost ran out by like eight, like it, it, up and down the block. They had like a little block party parents we met neighbors like it was actually pretty cool where, where is this uh Luby? did you Coral move to springs. utopia where are you Coral springs i know it's weird Coral it's springs like, Coral yeah. springs is like the 1980s <laughs> all right uh, it's the same in my son's neighborhood there are a lot of little kids there because there are a lot of young families uh in this Boca neighborhood that he lives in and so it, it's a big deal uh i had the over under uh, with the mustang at a half she bought a couple of bags of candy and i had it at a half the uh, over under number of kids that would show up at our door here now, where we are, there are about 80 units uh, in this uh, complex, if you want to call it that, uh, 80 uh, townhouses, and I see like maybe five kids total. Mm -hmm. There are like two families with kids, one with a three spot, one with a two spot, and they kind of live in a different section. So I figured those kids aren't probably going to go futilely knocking door to door because there are a lot of people that don't <laughs> live here full time also. Exactly. So uh, there are empty units uh, like like where I am. There, there's nobody. I mean, uh, we, we kind of have a whole section here to ourselves. Uh, so I, I figured if one kid showed up, then uh, I would go ahead and pay off on the overplayers. <laughs> and it was Blutarski City, man, 0.0, wow. 0 yesterday. <laughs> so we have a lot of little uh, candy bars. Uh, the Three Musketeers, remember, that was always a good one. You had to decide. Those were the tough choices in the vending machines when I was a kid. I don't know if uh, you had the same uh, degree of difficulty in, in figuring out what candy to buy. Now, the best of them by far was the Chunky with raisins. But the problem with the Chunky was it was what a chunk of chocolate, but uh, it was the smallest of the candy bars. <laughs> now, it might have been thicker, so you might have been getting the same amount of candy. But as a kid, you, you wanted largesse. Yes. That's what the attraction was. Uh, now, now Butterfingers, that, that was always uh, an interesting choice. So, the Clark bar, what happened to the Clark bar? Do you remember the Clark bar? 
Oh, that's before my time. I've heard of it. People the Clark Bar was like a better Butterfingers. I, I think it came out before the Butterfingers. Uh, the Butterfinger people said, hey, hey, wait a minute, man. They're selling a ton of Clark Bars, man. We ought to make something like that. <laughs> of course, there was the regular Hershey's chocolates, uh, you know, which uh, in, in like the sort of normal size, not like this Jay Gundo thing that uh, you would get, but, uh, you know, the regular size that you would put a quarter in a machine. I don't even know if they, they might have been like 10 cents candy bars in those days at a uh, subway station. But that was if the machine worked. Yeah. So you had to arm yourself with a lot of dimes. And then you would pull that thing and the lever would go snapping back in there and uh, you would look and go, what? What the fuck? Nothing. <laughs> so in New York, you would do the typical thing, the next best thing, which isn't like, uh, hey, a little bit of help. You shake the machine. And then if that didn't work, sledgehammer right through the machine. <laughs> For 10 cents. <laughs> well, then you would take all the candy bars and uh, everybody else would chime in there. They'd pick their way through the broken class and go, hey, nice job there, kid. What, you get robbed? <laughs> oh my god but uh yeah and and there were some interesting choices in this uh, mixed bag of candies uh little miniatures that the uh, mustang got uh there were uh mars bars remember mars bars i haven't seen a mars uh, bar. you had the the snickers the natural uh snickers uh three musketeers was always a good one and uh there were a couple of others uh you know that were in there that were kind of interesting so we're stuck with them all uh we, we don't have <laughs> We had zero negative distribution uh, yesterday on the uh, candy, and I didn't see a single kid the whole time that I was walking around on Halloween with a costume, not even my grandkids. Uh, but in, in that neighborhood where, where my son lives, uh, there were parades, man. Yep. Everybody goes out together. It's kind of cool. I mean, it used to happen uh, when I had the old Defoe Mansion there on uh, Southeast State Street, uh, and you know, I, I, I would get every now and then a line of kids. But I, I didn't have the patience to deal with it, so I, I actually, I mean, this could never work today. Right oh, with the, the young ball. Republicans, the honor system. Yeah. <laughs> Please try to take one or two. Don't be an asshole. There's always a fat kid running away with the bowl. Even a bowl would disappear. <laughs> it's great. Hope everybody had a good time. Uh, we, we certainly had a good time. Did you have a nice weekend, a three day weekend? And now this is a movement that's on. I believe it was something that's being floated by the people at Chick Fil A who don't work on Sundays already and. I was watching a news story, and I think they attached this to uh, Chick-fil-A, that uh, they were pushing for the idea, the concept of a three-day work week. Three-day work week. Oh, wow. Now, my first uh, job out of school, uh, my first uh, actual, uh, what would it be? I mean, regular shift type of job. Uh, my buddy and I, I had, I had a friend in uh, college, a guy named Jake Smiley, S-M-Y-L-I-E. The reason I spell that is because it is significant because uh, I don't know if you ever looked on the package of uh, Twizzlers, and I'm not sure. Maybe the company was bought out a few times. Uh, I'm sure this uh, man's uh, father is long since passed, but his father, what was the S in YNS Candies? Oh, which wow. manufactured Twizzlers, oh, among geez. other things. All right, so wow. the kid was uh, going to be filthy rich uh, someday. And, and you know, he, he didn't live like that, though. He was kind of a bohemian type like I was, and we decided to uh, move to Boston to become musicians. That was going to be our first thing. So uh, he played the guitar, and he wasn't really that accomplished at the guitar. I, I don't know what the fuck I was thinking. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> and I had, like, a pair of bongos, not even congas, bongos. <laughs> and it, it was too much to import my set of drums, and it wouldn't have worked anyway because the guy was playing an acoustic guitar. So we thought, well, where's a music scene that this kind of music fits? So we figured, all right, Boston sounds good because they got all these little coffee shops, and you can play, like, really lousy uh, kind of like in, uh, you know, to mention Blutarski again, uh, kind of like in Animal House when Stephen Bishop was sitting on the stairs. So, no, here, here's a real accomplished musician. That was part of the spoof of this. Uh, Stephen Bishop had a bunch of hits. One on one, I want to play that game tonight. Was that Hall & Oates? I don't know. He had a bunch of songs that were real big hits at the time. Stephen Bishop, look him up. He was good, you know, I mean, for, for the time. And, you know, this was at a time when, like, Joni Mitchell was big and all of these kind of folk singers what we're doing real well. So uh, we, we thought, OK, uh, this kid, Jake, uh, he had a fair voice, uh, was, uh, you know, I mean, nowhere near as accomplished on the guitar it, as you would have to be to be any kind of professional musician. And, and me, I'm sitting there with a pair of bongos between my knees. I may as well have been scratching my balls for the amount of uh, <laughs> attention we were going to get as a band. So uh, his father owned a cough drop factory in Boston. 
uh, or near Boston. And uh, so we figured, okay, we can get jobs at this cough drop factory, courtesy of his dad. And then we would, you know, work at night as musicians until we had uh, enough wherewithal uh, and steam behind us that we could quit the job, right? So now here is a weird thing, right? Because we're, we're getting this low-level job in a cough drop factory. Our, our job was to mix this giant vat of cough drop uh, and uh, lollipop type of uh, syrup. And, and then we had to take this stuff and stir it up on another machine so that it developed a consistency that they could turn it into lollipops and cough drops, all right? That, that's the job. You did this all day long. You had a big metal crowbar, and you just stirred this shit like you were making a big uh, vat of uh, spaghetti sauce somewhere in Italy, all right? All right, so the funny part was, though, I, everybody knew. Uh, now, I was a nobody in this equation. If I had just gotten this job, I, they would have said, okay, you're number 11496. Uh, here's where you punch in, and uh, make sure you're on time every day. And, and uh, you know, don't leave until your shift is up. But because uh, Jake was the son of the owner of the whole company, all right, this was a minor enterprise in the spectrum of YNS Candies, this cough drop lollipop factory that they had going in, uh, outside of Boston. And uh, I mean, imagine the suspicions that were aroused when the owner of the company's son is taking the lowest level entry level job <laughs> in the factory. There, there could only be one reason for that, and that is because the guy was there to spy on everybody and see what the hell was going on. So we got a really weird reaction. I mean, no matter what we did, it, it never really came into question. And, and I've told this story many times that uh, there was a big warning issued never to use the pineapple flavoring in any batch of lollipops that you were making. Never use the pineapple flavoring. And we're thinking, what's up with that, man? So, uh, of course, well, what's our first thing? And, and you can't believe how little flavoring there is in like a zillion cough drops and or uh, lollipops, Luby. Really? I mean, we measured the flavoring out. It would make this giant vat of the stuff. And the flavoring was measured in, in like uh, a minor amount of cubic centimeters. Wow. Right? You had this little tiny thimble of flavoring. It was so concentrated that, uh, I mean, I, honestly, I mean, like literally a shot glass full of flavoring would, would have blown the whole, uh, you know, equation out of the water there. And you would have had like... Uh, you know, inedible, uh, you know, lollipops and, and cough drops. It, it would have been so mind numbing that nobody, I mean, it would have been like dropping LSD or fentanyl. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we couldn't figure out what the hell. I mean, we got grape, we got lime, we got lemon, we got all this stuff. But why, why didn't they want to use the pineapple flavor? So naturally, first batch I'm mixing, I put the pineapple flavoring in to see what the hell was going on. The whole place smelled like we were in Oahu. <laughs> and uh, it turned out. The consistency with the pineapple flavoring was off, and it would back up all of the machines in the entire no. factory oh, no. so that everything started just falling on the floor like no. uh, through like this giant factory. Oh, no. <laughs> but because, you know, I mean, I was associated with the owner's son, they figured it was just something that we were put up to do to see how the place would react. So they all started cleaning up like maniacs, man, <laughs> and never questioned the fact that we were the assholes that put the pineapple flavoring. <laughs> Now, I bring this up for a different reason, though, because yeah. um, it, it was it was a very novel idea where uh, they had a four day work week. Mm -hmm. You would work four days and then get one day off. All right. So this was almost like a prison sentence when you had to go eight yeah. out of nine days because it wasn't an easy job. But you work four 10 hour days. All right. Mm -hmm. Had one day off. And then after the second set of four uh, 10 hour days, you had five days off. So every two weeks you had like a little vacation. Oh, wow. I, I don't know. I mean, a, you know, and as far as distributing work, uh, all right. So the extra two hours you're there anyway, maybe you're tired, maybe you don't feel like it. it. It didn't leave you much of a life when daylight savings time was on and, you know, it was getting dark at five o'clock and you're getting home. Uh, let's say you started at eight in the morning, then, then you were working until six at night. And by the time you were done, I mean, that was it. You know, there wasn't much time to go and play music. We ended up never playing a gig in the entire time we were there. <laughs> Only lasted a month on this job. And then I realized, what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> what are we going to come up with a hit song it's not like we were Simon and Garfunkel or anything and I don't sing I have a terrible singing voice so uh, there wasn't even a chance to harmonize we were going to have to rely solely on Jake Smiley's ability to uh, uh, be uh, you know uh, some kind of uh, pop singer and, and that wasn't happening but uh, the, the concept was great though I, I thought four days a week one day off four days a week five days off every two weeks you have a vacation what do you think Louie you like that I concept? I like the four-day work week. I don't need 
five days in a row consecutively. That that that's a lot to me. But I like the three day weekend. You and I've talked about this a long time. <laughs> like the three day weekend's great. I know. I, I don't think we could uh, bag Mondays, though. But maybe we should oh, just Monday's do, uh, like, no show on Wednesdays. Uh, you know, well, eventually, when, when the money's pouring in here and the streaming service really takes off, who knows? We'll, we'll uh, be able to just uh, tell somebody else to come in. We'll have some substitutes, some really lame substitutes, Louie, so that nobody ever gets too attached to them and starts thinking, wow, that guy's a breath of fresh air. Have you ever been called? No, not in your career. You haven't been called a breath of fresh air. Calls me a breath of fresh air. <laughs> the guy that recognized us the other day uh, when we were out doing the remote on the Mike Mayo show there at uh, Wicked Cheesesteaks recognized you immediately from your voice. Yes. Which, which was kind of cool. Yeah, 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 you're Luby. Yes. I always love that when you get that reaction. I had a land lovers the other night, too. A guy came over. So I was doing the trivia, and it was like three quarters through the night. And then out of nowhere, he comes over, and Ken's always la- Ken always laughs at this. He thinks it's funny. And the guy's like, you're Luby. And I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> He's like, I, I knew that voice. I knew it. I'm like, yeah. I mean, it you're is. waiting for him to ask for the money that you want back. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you're Luby, huh? All right. I hear you're doing well now. <laughs> but the three-day work week would be uh, kind of a novel thing. The no-day work week, I guess, is good, too. Uh, you know, my mother kept asking me about that. When are you going to retire? And I actually got that question last night when I was out playing tennis with my buddy, Dr. Jerry, who's my age. And my question to him should be, hey, Doc, when are you going to retire? Doctors can't retire anymore. I mean, uh, there, there was no easy path. Once uh, the insurance companies started stiffing doctors and paying them like 10 cents on the dollar, uh, didn't make it so easy. All those years in medical school, uh, you know, added up to a long, long run into your 70s, uh, still as a working man. But, uh, yeah, my mom used to ask me that all the time. Dr. Jerry asked me, hey, are you going to retire anytime? I'm like, what for, man? Well, it'd be I different. Mean, <laughs> why would you retire from this? <laughs> I might get up at six, I guess, but, like. Yeah, it might change the hours around. I mean, if you could do this from anywhere uh, in the world uh, for, like, an hour a day, this would be, like, the biggest piece of cake. That's my goal at this point in my life. Uh, just uh, narrow it down, and then whatever time you happen to feel like doing something, boom, you, you hop on the air and you do it. That, that'd be great. But in the meantime, we're here with a very structured program for you as uh, we're on 7 to 9 uh, every morning, uh, Monday through Friday. We, we skipped yesterday, so, I mean, it, it's a long way back to some of the stuff that was happening over the weekend in sports, which there were many, many things, including uh, last Friday was the opening of the World Series, a wild game, as the Astros looked like they were going to bury the Phillies. Almost everybody in the universe is rooting for the Philadelphia Phillies in the series. I, I don't think I've come across anybody yet that uh, says, uh, oh, yeah, well, I really want the Astros to win this thing. Now, the Astros are, are possibly falling into a category like the Atlanta Braves, where uh, they're, they'll be in their fourth World Series in six years. They've only won it one time, though. They're, they're a one and two in the previous uh, three starts, and they're sitting there at 1-1 one, one, uh, with now Philadelphia, at, at least uh, for the time being holding the fabled uh, home field advantage. And the home field was an advantage last night because it was soaking fucking wet. (laughs) (laughs) But it was an advantage because, and and this is an odd baseball thing. I was talking with Mr. Med, Ira Dornstein, who, uh, you know, at at 85, he's teaching a course in baseball. That's great. At, uh, where is it? At Hofstra, Hofstra University. They have like an adult education program. And uh, he's got, like he said, I had like 20 students enrolled in this thing. Oh, wow. But uh, the pandemic wiped them down to like 11. Okay. So he gets up there for two hours every day. And, uh, you know, I, I try to feed him some material here. And, and being a big Met fan that he is, Mr. Met, it's kind of interesting how some of these things and the ironies of sport are, you know, one of the most interesting aspects of it all. When, when you see uh, Zach Wheeler uh, was part of that tremendous rotation that the Mets had going back a few years ago well, where they had Matt Harvey was their ace and the guy, the Dark Knight, he was unbelievable. Looked like he was going to be the next Nolan Ryan. Uh, they had uh, DeGrom. They had Noah Syndergaard. Uh, they had Zach Wheeler and Steve Matz. Right? Yes. That was their starting five. I was like, wow, how could this team ever lose? Yeah, Wheeler was supposed to be the fifth guy. Wheeler, yeah, was the fifth guy. And then uh, th- th- he was the most expendable of, of the five guys. Yep. And they ended up letting him walk. Yep. And he ended up as a Philadelphia Philly and became like a Cy Young candidate every year. That guy's been dynamite. Uh, he got touched up a little bit in the first game in the World Series, but uh, nonetheless had a dynamite season for the Philadelphia Phillies, was a huge catalyst in the success that they had, even though they had the lowest uh, win total of any team that went into the postseason. And they have the Marlins to thank 
for their position here as they're now 1-1 in the World Series against the fabled Astros who won 106 games. And were it not for the fact that the Marlins won uh, like one of the last weekend games there as uh, they were playing. Well, I guess they played the Braves on the last weekend. That hurt. Uh, Wasn't it that uh, Mets series? They played a Mets series where they actually. Oh, yeah, the Mets. They played the Mets. Um, and uh, was, they, uh, they won one of the games and that was it. That, that gave the Braves the uh, National League Eastern Division clinching title. But they also helped the Phillies by beating the Milwaukee Brewers in a late season Brewers. series. Yes, yes, yes. And they won uh, at least one of those games, and, and that catapulted the Phillies into a position where they made the wild card, and uh, they have made the most of it, obviously, by getting to this point. But uh, Syndergaard and uh, Wheeler are now on the Phillies staff. Syndergaard was supposed to go last night. Now, there's not as much faith in Syndergaard. I don't know. Did he, did he do well this year? I, I, I remember seeing Damn him. At, what's that? Yeah, he was on the Angels, and then he ended up with Philadelphia. What? No, it's Syndergaard, yeah. Oh, so, uh, well, the Angels didn't do anything. They ended up firing their manager, and uh, they had a horrible year once again, which uh, every time the singing cowboy, Gene Autry, used to empty out his saddlebags, uh, it always ended up in disappointment. And it happened with uh, the owner of the Angels, who, who went all in with a lot of money a couple of years ago and really, and even, you know, emptied up big money for a manager in Joe Madden, but uh, none of it worked. They're always going to be the redheaded stepchild out there in uh, Southern California. Uh, there's a giant buzz around the Dodgers at all times, and even more so now because they've put themselves among the elite with, with a giant uh, payroll expenditure and going after virtually every free agent, a very attractive stop. You rarely hear people saying, and, and it is Southern California. It's actually a nicer part of Southern California than L.A., uh, <laughs> Orange County. It really is. I mean, it's a bastion of conservatism, but it couldn't be any more beautiful there, and yet nobody wants to play for the Angels, right? I mean, you rarely see somebody go, wow, I, I really, uh, my whole life, I wanted to be uh, a member. Of, and, and they even changed the name of the team from the California Angels, which was this general generic BS that uh, we have here with the Florida Panthers. And we had it with the Florida Marlins. And, you know, it doesn't really distinguish anything. But uh, now they're the Los Angeles Angels, which is really a misnomer because uh, they're not actually in Los Angeles. And there is a team there. How weird is that? But they've always been the redheaded stepchild. So uh, they got rid of a bunch of players, I guess, or at least Syndergaard went okay. to Philadelphia. He was supposed to start last night, and he, he was their most suspect starter in the rotation, Noah Syndergaard, who used to be brilliant. Uh, sure. Had Tommy John, as did Wheeler. They both had Tommy John surgery, I believe. And uh, Wheeler excels. But but now that rain out benefited the Philadelphia Phillies because they could push Syndergaard back to a game that uh, maybe game five, and uh, they're going to start that guy Suarez tonight, which uh, I believe the weather is supposed to clear out. It's not exactly like my game to uh, predict the weather in Philadelphia, but I thought I saw something on one of the late night news shows that I was watching at three in the morning when I woke up and I said, what am I doing up? And uh, it was talking about a clearing in the Northeast. So okay. hopefully, uh, hopefully game three is on. And uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, Ramber Suarez, some, oh. some weird first name. And uh, he's going to be on the mound tonight for Philadelphia. So that, that gave him a little bit of an edge in uh, the series because they were able to juxtapose a couple of things. Is it Ranger? It's spelled like Ranger, Suarez. Ranger? All right. Maybe it's pronounced Ranger. No, I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, I'm not that familiar with the guy, although uh, I guess he's, uh, what, their number three guy uh, behind Wheeler and Nola. And so uh, now Nola will, will move up a spot also and uh, be available for uh, game four. So. Kind of interesting, uh, you know, although, uh, boy, is that thing on the back burner, the World Series? That was Friday. Uh, it started, and, and they had a great game, 6-5, 10 innings, and then the Astros uh, came right back and hammered. Uh, they hammered, what, Nolan, uh, game two. And uh, you know, they had started the game with, like, three straight ringing doubles, held on to win at 5-2. So it's 1-1 uh, in the World Series, which now goes deep into November. Unbelievable. As uh, you know, they, they've lost the, uh, you know, the focus uh, of the general sporting public. Uh, that uh, was just the beginning. Now, last night, how improbable was this? Uh, you know, and I, I, I'm not a trend guy, as I've said many times. Uh, the fact that Joe Burrow was 0-3 against the Cleveland Browns, would that have factored into your uh, mental approach to the game if you were going to go ahead and take three points with the Browns at home against the Cincinnati Bengals? Who, who had gotten off the mat. Remember, they started out with two hideous losses. So uh, they were sitting there at uh, four and three. So they had managed to, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, resurrect things and get it together. Uh, they had won four uh, of their uh, 
uh, next five games after starting out 0-2, and, and those were two real tough beats, as I recall, for the Cincinnati Bengals. And, and the big problem that the Bengals have is, uh, how, how's this sound? Does this sound familiar at all, Luby? No offensive line. Ah. <laughs> no pass protection for Joe Burrow. Joe Cool, uh, I mean, is just getting pummeled back there. And, you know, so, uh, you know, you're figuring, all right, the Browns are going to do everything they can to put some pressure on this guy. And they did, man. They hammered him uh, in this game. I don't like to say hammered anymore because of the Pelosi thing, which, by the way. Oh, my God. That woman that's running for governor in Arizona, it's just so typical. Tuesday is a week away Election Day, and I'm in a panic here because I think the country is about to take a real, real big dive into into the darkest area in the existence of this country. Gas may be cheaper. Maybe food prices come down. Look, it's all relatable to everybody here, uh, this inflation. I, I, I bought, I want to say, six items last night at the grocery store on my way back from playing tennis. $67. Oh, Jesus. All right. Now, a couple of them were like pricey items like sunscreen. And because the sunscreen is so outrageously overpriced, I bought the two pack to save two dollars. How, how about this? Uh, you know, you talk about fighting inflation. Why, why does this even happen? I actually, uh, the uh, gas tax uh, relief that uh, Florida was providing uh, it goes off as of today, right? So that's going to add twenty five cents a gallon yes. every gallon of gas. People are going to look on the signs and go, "What? What? What happened? Oh my God! Kill Biden! You're going to blame Biden, yeah? They're going to be storming the White House uh, after today. You know, Which uh, all that happened was. They gave you the twenty-five cent uh, relief there for a month or however many months. I guess was it just uh, October? It was, it was one month. One month. Okay, great job, Ron. Ron DeSantis there. Who I mean, is he so far ahead in this race? That he he doesn't even campaign in the state anymore. Nah. He's the go-to guy. I mean, he's Trump too, and every other governor that's running, he's out there stumping for them. And I'm like, wait a minute, man! You're, you're a week away from an election here in Florida, and he's out there in New York trying to uh, get the uh, Republican uh, conservative right wing maniac across the finish line here, and uh, he's become wow, uh, a little bit of a poster child, huh? That stunt with the migrants that put him in a very favorable light but with, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, what is no longer a silent minority or silent majority uh, here in this country. Uh, just crazy. Well, I, I know. When do you see that, though? I mean, we're a governor in a race that's supposed to be. I mean, look, is it's obviously no contest according to the polls, but uh, I mean, it doesn't even campaign in his own state anymore. No. But this chick in Arizona, Lake, I believe, is her last name, and she was like a television anchor woman, and now she's running for governor, and she's probably going to win. Uh, big uh, support from uh, the man himself, uh, Donnie Trump, and uh, I mean, just hideous what's going on in this country where. She's actually making jokes about, uh, you know, this Pelosi guy getting hit in the head with a hammer and having his skull fractured by some maniac. No, that's not to blame the MAGA Republicans. I mean, the guy's a nutbag. Uh, you know, sure, a lot of the, you know, stuff seems to fit where, you know, all of the things that, that uh, you know, he, he was uh, decrying on his uh, social media were, you know, let's, let's face it. They, they were ideas that are being perpetuated and uh, proliferated by, by the MAGA Republicans that the election was a fraud, that, you know, I mean, and, and, and are we never going to accept the results of any election if the Republicans lose? Well, is it always going to be? That's the thing. If the Republicans win, we will, because the Democrats like that we live in a democracy. The Republicans have gotten to this thing where they are accepting fascism, which I don't understand, because the red Russians and USSR Soviets, the Republicans hated them more than the Dems. The Dems were the ones that were accused of being communists all the time. So, like, it's such a weird reversal where, the Republicans are now the ones that are owning fascism just because no. they want their way so bad that they're okay with fascism. But um, yeah, you're, you know, if the Republicans lose races, that's their move. Even when there's no evidence and the stuff they're saying is obviously lunatic. They don't care. It's just, it's just a well, and uh, you know, in many of the cases uh, that were being questioned and challenged, that there was a Republican that was in charge of running the election. Yep. And fortunately, exactly. those guys had some integrity and said, uh, listen, man, there was nothing wrong here. This is the way it went. You guys lost. If you don't want to accept it, that's your business. But uh, you know what? I mean, uh, why don't you do something about it, like storm the Capitol building? That would be a good idea. Anyway, this Lake woman is, uh, I mean, to me, just disgusting, despicable, uh, the things that she says. And, and to condone uh, the idea with a joke. And everybody's laughing, too. This, this is what scares me about Psychos. the direction of this country, that people are laughing about the fact that a guy got hit in the head with, with a hammer. 
an 82 year old man. I, I don't care who, who he was. I mean, or, or what, uh, you know, if you, you could think Nancy Pelosi is a drunken slob who has no business being in, you know, the Congress and, uh, okay, fine. That's your opinion. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know that I agree with all of that, but, uh, but whatever. I mean, but, but how do you condone the idea that somebody broke into her house and, and, and hit her husband in the head with a hammer and you're running for public office, governor of the state of Arizona, and you're like, <laughs> you see what happened there? She don't have very good security there. Maybe she'll get one of those doorbell ringers. It's like, I, I mean, that's insane, isn't it? And people are, are applauding, yeah, laughing. <laughs> nuts. Well, especially a government Absolutely nuts. Or like, running for... I mean, Herschel Walker, like all of it, it's, I don't care what Herschel side Walker, that, that's a whole nother thing, man. That's next week. Like, come on. I keep looking at the beach houses, Luby, in Costa Rica. Becoming... <laughs> I never thought I would say that. I'm, I'm a red-blooded American, man. I love this country. And if Republicans are empowered, okay, uh, let's hope they do some good. That, that's always been my approach. That's all you can hope for, uh, you know, and I, in general, my thinking has always been along Democratic lines, but... Uh, uh, look, I, I, if somebody was out there and doing some real good, you know, and I was a member of the Republican Party, fine, good. When, when Ron DeSantis first took over as governor, he, his first act was kind of like a an encouraging sign before he became like this uh, megalomaniac there and, um, you know, got drunk with power. But uh, didn't he do something about the fungus or whatever, that yeah, algae? It was had that red algae or whatever, and yeah. he acted swiftly. And I thought, wow, well, maybe. Yeah. The whole time. He did a move that looked good, and then the people in the area were like, yeah, he didn't do anything. He just <laughs> said he was doing something. And that's what he – right. Mercy's running about education are my favorite because I have people in education. And my sister and my mom, my cousin teaches. I have friends that teach. And they all roll their eyes. <laughs> and you're like, why? They're, I'm like, didn't you get a raise? No, we never saw the raise. Like, the raise was bullshit. And then yeah. we never got it. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, you, you would think this guy was, uh, you know, uh, doing things like, like, you know, Abe Lincoln did. Back in 1860. I mean, by the commercials, monumental change. I, I haven't seen that much of it. I inflation, though, let's face it, seven, I think it was seven items, $67 yesterday. Jesus. Sunscreen, honey, some uh, Natalie's orange juice. Okay, well, that's a little pricey. I understand that. Uh, razor blades, the cheapest razor blades, which go for like 10 bucks a bag, as you can tell, and not exactly a great shave uh, here. And, and that's it, 70 bucks. So I understand where people. I don't know that they could just uh, immediately categorize that as being the, the sole responsibility of Joe Biden, that you're paying $70 at the uh, grocery line for seven items. One bag, one of those little plastic bags, Libby, not even like a giant paper bag, one bag. And, and it's funny, I, I said to the Mustang, can you believe this? Uh, here's one bag of groceries. Uh, you know, I can carry it very easily. I, I can balance it on my pinky. 70 bucks. And she's like, well, uh, that's not bad. <laughs> like it's not good <laughs> i was you know grew up in the days where the guy had a little pencil behind his ear and he would write down you know everything and then add it up on the bag uh, and you know if your grocery bill came to three dollars and fifty cents so that was a lot uh, all right uh getting back to sports though uh sorry i you know, went into a long uh I, i'm just a little nervous about next tuesday i really am it's gonna be scary uh it's interesting as the sans has been a total disaster and most people with logic hate him and he's gonna win by more like they didn't know who he was and he won by literally went to a, a recount over That's a cracker was over a guy that ended up being a total disaster in Gillum. And this time, and look, Chris is such a milk toast, flippy floppy thing that no one really likes him, but yeah. he has a track record over more than Gillum had. And the Sanders wasn't good. And he spent the last year just campaigning for president. He hasn't yes. even been in the state at all. And everything he's done has been a disaster. And somehow he's winning in a land. It's just weird. And Rubio is a Lance spot. Right. Rubio outside yeah. of the Cuban Miamians. Hated. Val Demings is respected. She has money behind her, national money. She's done a really good job. She's literally all the things the Republicans want. She's lost. She's losing too. Yeah. And they're close now. And she was kicking his ass. And Rubio has done nothing. He doesn't go nothing. and vote. He no. hasn't done any commercials. He hasn't campaigned. But because the Cuban his, his commercials would make you never vote for him. No, just just a smarmy <laughs> look that he has. It's just like. But the Miami Cuban is so strong. I don't know why, but they're so strong yeah. that they out way everyone it's really weird and this uh, maria elvira salazar uh, oh, running for a local office down here in miami she's, yeah. she's wow. like costa rica is calling my friend <laughs> as long as they don't cut social security man which is supposed to get a massive increase there of 8.7 percent 
So uh, that puts me in a category where uh, you can almost uh, count that as a reasonable piece of your income at that point. No, always nice to collect. And Medicare, too, I mean, uh, let's face it. Like I say, Luby, you call a doctor and a guy tells you he doesn't have an appointment until next June. <laughs> and then they ask you what your insurance is. You say Medicare. They send a car for you right now. <laughs> I told my parents because I think they just started using it. My mom's like, Michael, it's so great. I'm like, oh, my God, Mom, you don't know. defo has been raving about it for like three years. Oh, no, it's the best. <laughs> Devo loves it. Devo's never gone to so many doctors. <laughs> well, I mean, you don't have to go to a primary care guy. So you can waltz in anywhere you want, anywhere in the world. You can go see anybody. And unless you uh, sign up for that Jimmy Walker thing, which I think puts you on an HMO. So you get like $140 back in your check, but, uh, you know, or in your payment. But you lose all of this, uh, you know, just freedom that you have in the medical world, which uh, now, you, you know, I mean, who wants to go to see somebody to go see somebody else, right? <laughs> Your knee's hurting you, so you go to some schmink that uh, doesn't even deal with, like, uh, orthopedics, and he says, okay, you can go to this guy. I mean, that's crazy. And then you have to make another appointment and go through the whole uh, schmageggy thing all over again if uh, that doesn't work out. Uh, but uh, the last thing I had uh, from a medical standpoint, and I don't take as much advantage of it as I should because I hate doctor's offices yeah. in general. I mean, uh, but I'll go get some checkups now that I normally would have uh, forsaken. And, you know, get checked down for skin cancer or whatever, you know, because uh, what the hell? It's a freebie. It's on the house. That's and, uh, and and they can't wait to welcome you in there. I mean, uh, literally priority on every appointment that you could possibly get. But I, I was getting my knee uh, jacked with this uh, stuff called Sinvac, which uh, re really, I mean, turned out great for me. I, I, when it was going in, I wasn't so convinced that it was a good idea. Because uh, it's one of those things where you're not feeling pain, but it's so squeamish. And you're like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> One of those things where you can feel this like gel being shot in there to like what's bone on bone. And you're like, oh, my God. But um, it's been around for a while. Uh, this was some other, uh, you know, high end version of it. But my doctor is tremendous. Uh, if you need an orthopedic guy, William McKay in Fort Lauderdale, uh, he, he's treated me twice for stuff that I thought was uh, going to be very prohibitive and, uh, you know, debilitating. Boom. Good as new. Uh, like uh, very shortly thereafter. So um, anyway, he, he tells me, he says, oh, good, you're on Medicare. And, and, and the guy is a fan of the shows. He, he was a listener for a long time. He, he knew me. And, uh, you know, it's always nice. Come in there, talk a little sports for a while. And then the pain starts. But uh, he, uh, he he said, if you weren't on Medicare, he said, I, it's good because I can give you this shot right now and it's going to help you out a lot or potentially so, which it did. Uh, but if I was just uh, any other insurance, I would have had to go through like a month's worth of uh, red tape to even get to the point where I might be able to get the shot, which uh, my knee was killing me that day. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been there in the first place. So, I, you know, who wants to wait around? So the Medicare accelerated, expedited the ability to be treated, which uh, that's one benefit of getting old, Luby. That's But they're <laughs> going to take it away anyway. I mean, it's over. The whole party's over. That's good. <laughs> gonna be like walking around on crutches here, man. I'm sitting in a wheelchair. All the social security I paid into will be gone. Instead of running around playing tennis on a Monday night. Beautiful night, by the way, man. This is why we live in Florida. It was great. All right, so I come home. Uh, World Series game has rained out. I have the Browns uh, getting three points against the Bengals, and you would think, what? Well, when I first oh, saw. <laughs> the... <laughs> it gets worse, though, Louis. I, I turned into you last night. I, although okay. I. I for, for the um, nominal amount of money that we're talking about here in my personal betting with Francesco, it, it just it makes these games interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had to watch FAU. Uh, no, FIU. Oh, again, oh, FIU, not oh, FAU. Yeah. FAU is like, uh, you know, Wisconsin compared to FIU. <laughs> like a team that every now and then pops up there and you go, wow, they're, they're pretty damn good. Um, FIU, I had to watch them and uh, they pulled out an overtime thriller. Over, I can't even remember La who the Tech. hell they played. I would take La Tech. That's not even good. Louisiana La Tech. Tech, yeah. What's with Francesco? <laughs> but Louisiana Tech was favored in the game by six points on the road, even though they had like two wins. Why would you pick that game? Like that's just weird. They go up ten nothing in this game, and and what's great is I'm watching on TV, and that makes <laughs> maybe four eyeballs total that are on this game. God, dude, you're watching La Tech and FIU. I'm watching FAU football. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Put a couple of bucks. And anyway, I come home last night and, and the World Series is rained out, and I have uh, Cleveland getting three to finish out the week. 
Uh, I got uh, that that Green Bay line. Can anybody verify this uh, for me? That Green Bay line uh, when uh, you know Green Bay went get, went against the Bills. Wasn't that over ten points? That was not ten points straight up, was it? Not straight up. Uh, but I mean, that, that wasn't a flat ten point line, was it? it settled at ten. I don't well, know what you said. Oh, it didn't. Okay, because uh, you know my my friend, he gets his lines out of the Jewish Journal, which uh, ten and a hook here. Know. It says ten and a hook here. Packers covered ten and a hook. It what was ten and a hook everywhere, except for the oh. fact that uh, I only got ten. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Segreno when you need him? <laughs> right, get an extra couple of points there. Exactly. I saw that line at eleven and a half. You know, and I, I let him get by with his ten points because I, I was thinking Aaron Rodgers has to be pissed enough to not want to look like a an absolute chump in, in this game. They don't even throw the ball anymore. The Green Bay Packers, they just run it. Yeah, it's bad. And uh, I don't know if the Bills showed any vulnerability to the run, but uh, the Packers managed to get a backdoor cover by getting a touchdown after the game was well decided, and they got within 10 points. So I ended up with a push in that game. So so I'm really hoping to win this uh, Browns game. But I'm figuring when I first saw that I had the Browns plus three against the Bengals, Bengals, as I said, have kind of you know corrected things a little bit anyway, and they won some ball games. Uh, they had won four out of five since uh, the 0-2 start. And – they're going into Cleveland where you know, they're starting Jacoby Brissett, still waiting for Deshaun Watson, a disgraced human being, to uh, come back and be their savior at quarterback at $230 million guaranteed. And uh, what? I mean, are they taking calls already on, like, Nick Chubb uh, at uh, in Cleveland? No? Not Chubb. Chubb, no. Kareem Hunt is the one. It's funny. No, oh, Kareem Hunt. He, he doesn't even play uh, Hunt. Last night, he, he actually had some interesting plays, but no, Chubb's one of the top five running backs in football, so Hunt is sort of expendable. Well, and he was all of that uh, last night in the ball game, and Brissett actually made a couple of really good passes. <laughs> and Mari Cooper woke up, too. That was weird. Mari Cooper, <laughs> wow, that was some catch he made. Because <laughs> the throw was a little bit offline, uh, but you know, not enough so that uh, you could really complain about it. And the guy was uh, double-covered, although he was behind both uh, of the defenders. And then he had to kind of cut over towards the middle of the field to catch the ball, which was thrown 50 yards in the air. And he grabs it. I mean, you, you talk about making a great catch. I've seen Amari Cooper drop some passes. But, man, that, that was a great catch. That, and he made uh, going to the ground and having to adjust in, uh, you know, mid-flight of the ball. Two guys in his face about to, uh, you know, absolutely crown him. And uh, he goes to the ground and hangs on to the ball even as he hits the ground. Manages to cover it up, and uh, that was a huge, uh, you know, transitional play in that game because at the time you were thinking, well, you know, there's an outside chance Cincinnati can chip their way back into this thing. But uh, they never really got it rolling. Uh, they did score a couple of quick touchdowns, which made you think it's the Browns. See, it, it, when you have even the smallest amount of money on a game, you will watch it to the bitter end because you know in the NFL it could be the Heidi game. You know, uh, the minute you think it's in the bag, something bizarre happens. As was the case, I mean, if you're a New York Jets fan, wow. We're going to get into all of this stuff with John Kajemi here in a few minutes on uh, John Kajemi's Pigs Again Playbook. But, uh, and and uh, we haven't even touched on college football, which most people said this. I, I, I saw, like, the overtime period only, which, uh, you know, was kind of uh, weird. Uh, okay, uh, no uh, visual of John Kajemi. Wow. All right. We'll have him on the phone, though, and uh, we'll talk about all of this stuff with him. Uh, most people were posting, and now this is not uncommon, this kind of outrage. And, and it's it really stands out, this whole concept, if, if indeed you find it to be true, that the Miami University of Miami-Virginia game was the worst football game they've ever witnessed. Defoe, it was, was it 6-6 six, six going into the overtimes or 3-3? Three, three? Yes, 6-6. Six, six. <laughs> and I didn't know that they had changed this rule because uh, I'm 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 laying three with the Hurricanes, and you know not by choice. I don't not by choice. I would have gone the other way because the Hurricanes have not impressed me at all this year. In spite of and Segreno, I mean, if he comes on again this week, uh, Luby, we're gonna have to really Virginia's bad. Question, Tony. Really bad. Like Virginia's really bad, and they were at home once again, and they couldn't get a touchdown. They couldn't get one touchdown. Like not one. Nothing. Yeah. And the Canes needed a last-second field goal to get into that, uh, you know, hellacious six-six tie. What do you mean? They were stopped at the goal line, and yeah. it was Nate. Is he going to go for it and kick the field goal? Oh, you have a zillion chances to cover in this game too. I mean, come on, Mario Cristobal. If you're going to be lousy and boring, and 
you know, constantly be having to uh, make the excuse that, well, you know what? These are Manny's players, man, and they weren't very good. Come on. Then, uh, you know, I mean, uh, did that not include a Heisman Trophy candidate quarterback? They don't even play him. He's benched now. They're, he's not even playing. <laughs> not and even playing. And the other guy is, uh, uh, you know, no bargain. Oh, he looks rough. Man. Garcia, who was a huge recruit, by the way, yeah. that, that they were able to get because where he was going to go had another quarterback. Uh, it does not look good. I, I don't know. Look, I mean, well, I was that play. the worst college football game ever played? There had to be something. Yeah, only was, uh, goals. When they won by two, I forgot like what you were just about to get into. That the third after- overtime, they only go to two-point conversion. So now if you're laying three, you can't cover anymore. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I was like, you know, the uh, – Virginia had opened up uh, the overtime with a field goal, and you thought, oh, good, right? Just go in, get a touchdown here, and, and we cover the point spread, and everybody walks out of this happy, as dreadful as the game might have been. Thank God I was at the beach. I, I didn't see any of it. <laughs> I didn't watch it. I was, what's funny is I was trying to watch it because FSU had already played, and I already knew what was going on with FSU, so I was like, all right, let me see what's going on with this game, and I couldn't find it. It wasn't on – Every game's on TV now. There's a hundred different channels that have college football. And it was only online. And then I tried to go online and then it was like blacked out. So like I guess it was on Sunshine Network or something. It might have been on uh yeah, Bally Sports Sun. I don't have that. So I'm like, I can't watch the game even if I want to. (laughs) That's bad. Yeah. I mean, that's a long way from where you want to be when you can't even get your your team, you're supposed to be one of the big teams in the country and you're on the precipice of uh, coming back to this level of greatness that, you know, it was a, as good as any in college football history over a 20 year span uh, with this uh, private school here, which has a very small student body. It's not like you're going to find a long snapper, you know, as a walk on necessarily. I mean, uh, they don't, don't even have that many kids there. Right. Uh, so, uh, you know, I mean, the likelihood that uh, they can prosper under these circumstances, even with Ruiz shelling out cash, is is negative. Well, what's interesting uh, is uh, yeah. it was a weird week for them because they they did get committed. I don't know if he's going to sign. To me, I still find it hard that he's going to go there. The number two recruit in the country. Like, it was a big deal. Like, Alabama, Florida. Florida, he supposedly had him in the bag. But Alabama was going after him hard. And Miami got him. Cormani McLean, DB. Number two recruit in the country. It's a big freaking deal. And then they go and play like that. And I'm like, and I get it. He's on the defensive side. but <laughs> Well, and, and you're playing in front of nobody also. I mean, uh, imagine what a thriller would be to come running out of the tunnel there as a college football player. I mean, uh, you know, even if you were a scrub on a team, uh, especially. And, and, you know, as dreadful as they are under Jimbo, uh, you know, you're running out on the field at Texas A&M and 100,000 or Michigan or Ohio State or Alabama, or any of these, Clemson, any of these places where, where the crowd is just insane. Yep. And then, you know, you're recruiting, you're on the sidelines there at Hard Rock Stadium for a home game, and there were like 8,000 people in the stands there. And you feel like JT Real Muto going to the plate after they had... It's like a Marlins game. Imagine how happy that guy is not to be a Marlin. My God. Series for the Phillies. <laughs> Could have been us, right? Oh my God! Yeah. But anyway, uh, so is that true, people? I mean, uh, feel free to weigh in on us on the chat line. There, we got Julian uh, in contact with us, and uh, Anthony as well, and a couple of others. So uh, feel free to uh, you know weigh in. Was that the worst college football game ever played? The Miami Virginia game, <laughs> and it left such a stench, you know, in uh, Virginia that it's hard to. Uh, I mean, you have a rivalry game that used to be so compelling. That if it was Tuesday, you you would not be able. When we had eight phone lines working at WQAM, and uh, before that at WIOD, if Miami and Ohio State were going to play, uh, you never had to do a thing though on the talk show. It, it, it was fantastic. We had three guys sitting there on the first team: Joe Rose and uh, Steve Goldstein, me. We all like to talk. Three guys. We, we didn't have to say anything. All, all we do is go, uh, Manny Miramar, you're on. Uh, you know the first team, and the guy go, you know what? And, and they were going into the whole thing. And the next guy would call up and, you know, he, he would be on the opposite side. And, and it was a great rivalry. It was always considered to be, I mean, unlike this ugliness that took place with Michigan and Michigan State. What did you make of that, Louis? Oh, my God. They, 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 uh, Harbaugh wants criminal charges. For us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, you're kind of freezing up there a little bit. I don't know. You may need to uh, get into some kind of rebooting thing there because uh, we're looking a little bit like a kung fu movie, at least the way it's coming through for me. So uh, hopefully you'll catch up with it. Uh, what I mean, yeah. Did, did you say that this was – what the hell is that? Unbelievable. The sanctimony of college sports. Uh, you know, that, that, that's horrible what, what happened there. They, they literally hazed this kid like he was on the, uh, you know, the bus on the FAMU band, you know, and uh, going through his initiation. That was that was some serious ugliness, I, and I can understand uh, Jim Harbaugh being outraged by it. Uh, nobody, I mean, obviously, you know, even Michigan State, they were very humbly saying, "Hey, this is this is nothing that we can justify." Did they uh, uh, suspend some uh, players and or uh, just uh, you know kick them off the team? They did. Michigan I don't know State about kickoffs. I know they're they're suspending guys and they're living punishments. I I just thought the whole thing was ridiculous. And why why do you have guys coming out of the same? I don't know understand that like rivals coming out of the same tunnel that just doesn't seem smart at all isn't that like how it worked is that they all that doesn't that happen everywhere though i mean uh, look college, there's only one way college that, that you know the, the the teams go through the tunnel and then they go their separate ways no i don't i don't know they uh, made a big deal of it like it's not normal for them to yeah across paths like that all right uh you're you're in a little snap crackle and pop mode there i don't know if you want to uh, reboot this thing real quickly but uh, uh we're going to tell you about hylia park and, uh, wow, I mean, uh, Breeders' Cup is on the horizon here. That's Friday and Saturday. Now, that's the world's uh, championships of thoroughbred racing. It is going to be a blast. I, I was actually watching. Uh, I happened to be, like, uh, dozing off there late in the afternoon, turn on uh, TVG, or uh, now known as FanDuel uh, TV, and they were having the draw for the Classic. Calipari was uh, the guy pulling the pills. Uh, you know how they do the horse racing draw? Have you ever seen one, uh, Libby? where one guy pulls a number out of a little pillbox there and the racing secretary has the names of the horses. And so it's, you know, done uh, like you're shuffling the deck there and by arbitrary, by arbitrary, you know, uh, draw. And so, you know, and they don't draw the, you know, the numbers don't come out like, okay, number one is so-and-so number two is so-and-so. So, uh, Calipari, uh, you know, is doing the draw and uh, very slick. John Calipari. He looks very happy. Isn't Kentucky supposed to be great this year? College basketball on the horizon. will be Kentucky. Going to win it? They got another great class. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Supposed to be good. All right. Should be. And they got that uh, stud came back, right? What's the guy? Uh, he, was he injured last year? What's his name? Tsunami or something like that? Uh, the kid with the T. Uh, he's got a weird name. He uh, he's, he's coming back, is he not, to uh, Kentucky? Or do I have that wrong? Let me, he looks I don't stunned. know Kentucky at all. Yeah, I don't know Kentucky even a little. Good for you. Yeah, I don't either, obviously, since I can't even think of the guy's name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Calipari fan ever since we saw him there in Houston that time, holding court in the uh, headquarter hotel for the Final Four. And he wasn't in the Final Four, but, man, he, he you know, clearly what was the dominant force there. Seven guys, seven, five, you know, that had just been outside. They, they wouldn't even let him see Calipari until they could make nine out of ten from three. Right, remember that, and, and all of these giants are out there, and you're thinking, "Wow, what, what is this? The circus is showing up here?" And it literally was. It was a circus of seven foot freaks that all had basketball talent, and they were just lining up, kissing the ring of John Calipari as he sat on the couch while the other coaches were all nervously running around, going, "Ah, uh, what are they doing talking to Calipari?" <laughs> it was great. He really is. I mean, he he had that same kind of thing going as uh, Rick Pitino does. Right where he's got this kind of magnetism in the basketball world, especially, and you could see where kids, uh, you know, end up wanting to play for the guy because uh, you know in Lexington certainly uh, he is the man. So uh, anyway, and uh, it looks like it's going to be really competitive. Uh, they may made uh, Flightline a, a three to five favorite in the classic. This horse is supposed to be a monster. Uh, the serious challenge w would come from a horse uh, that campaigned uh, largely on the East Coast. I want to say life is good. And uh, a lot of people are fans of Life is Good. This West Coast uh, thing with Flightline, everybody wants to see the West Coast horses turn out to be phonies. But uh, it's supposed to be like Secretariat, this horse. Five for five, three to five, a morning line favorite in the classic, whereas uh, Life is Good, who is a you know outstanding racehorse, is a six to one in the morning line as the third choice behind Epicenter. Do I backwheel Epicenter in the Breeders' Cup Classic and hope that Flightline uh, gets left in the gate? What do you think? No, why not? No, let me. But if you were going to do it somewhere and you wanted to get the feeling of being at Keeneland, which 
is really, I mean, a cathedral of thoroughbred racing. You know, if if you wanted to go to the place in the sport that you would always want to go to see a race of this magnitude, it would be Keeneland, and, and that is second only to Hialeah. If you want to get that feeling at Hialeah Park uh, that, that you're at Keeneland, you, you can save yourself the $700 hotel room, the Allegiant flight scare that you're going to have getting to Lexington. Maybe you're enough of a schmuck to go ahead and drive it because you're afraid to fly. Like, I mean, I don't want to call him a schmuck because he's a good guy. George the Animal Steel, we're driving the Churchill Downs. Hello for the Derby. <laughs> Thank God for those Marinol balls. I had to fleece a cancer patient of his Marinol balls so I could survive the ride to Kentucky 13 <laughs> hours each way. The, the big highlight was stopping in Micanopy and uh, the Cafe Risqué, where I got that tip. Right? Remember that? And uh, that was, uh, you know, that Urban Meyer was going to leave Florida and coach Notre Dame. Close. Which, okay, so you're getting this tip from a woman who's wearing pasties and a G-string, who goes about 57 years old, has been working at the Risqué since it opened, and, you know, is bringing you, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, an omelet. Uh, I, I said, uh, yeah, easy on the omelet there. Uh, I don't want that thing to burn. And she's telling you that uh, through her sources, which you would think uh, would be credible, uh, that Urban Meyer is going to leave the University of Florida and, and end up coaching at Notre Dame. And, and he did leave and went to Ohio State shortly after. So, okay, that's like that Mayo thing with the Panthers where, you know, your, your thinking is right there. But you just can't quite put it together there in, in the, uh, you know, a kind of intangible world of sporting results that, that take place. But uh, anyway, yeah, we were there, and um, uh, you know, it, it was it was fantastic. But you, you don't want to schlep all the way in a car to uh, like uh, Lexington. Go to Hylia Park, plunge away in total comfort there. Uh, the Champion Simulcasting Room. I, I would make a reservation for both days. Friday, you have five races, and then Saturday nine more. Uh, There's going to be racing all over the country. You know, the other tracks always put on a pretty good show on those days as well, and they usually start early to kind of clear out so the people can. A bet and concentrate on these Breeders' Cup races, which are almost always sensational and produce a lot of wild results. You'll have horses that are uh, six for six lifetime going off at 40 to one. I mean, it's just great. Uh, so uh, make your plans to be at Hylia Park, Champion Simulcasting Room. Do it in uh, like supreme comfort. I, I was just at another pair of mutual place, very near to the Deef household. Obviously, you know, it's not uh, necessarily uh, something that you're going to drive. Like in my case, it would be like 45 minutes. As much as I love Hialeah, if there's a place 10 minutes away, it's kind of like pizza we were talking about, Louie, right? Like, uh, you know, there could be like the, the most amazing pizza place 45 minutes away, but you're going ahead and saying, hey, I'll have this schlock piece of uh, cardboard from Domino's because it's closer to the house. That's the way that goes. But I was telling people at this local paramutual facility, Hialeah Park, the place to go for the Breeders' Cup. And, uh, and once you go down there, you might consider, hey, you know what? It's worth a little drive here to uh, be in this kind of comfort and have these kind of accommodations as opposed to the usual thing. Hey, Mo, can you get somebody to fix this machine? Yeah, it's well in my voucher. And you can't find anybody, right? You're, you're talking to a cleaning guy that doesn't speak any English. And he's there, like, raking up the tickets that are thrown on the floor. And you go, hey, 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 can you help me here? Help me. And the guy's like, eh, no comprende. Go to Hylia Park, man. They know how to take care of their customers. All right, we're coming back with uh, John Kajemi, a, a little pigskin playbook. Sorry we're not going to be able to see John because he always brightens up the show because the guy is as handsome as they come. And, uh, you know, a little man crush, I would have to say, I have on uh, John Kajemi. I'm not ashamed to admit that at my age. I mean, I'm perfectly comfortable with my sexuality. And, you know, I mean, if I was a woman, <laughs> <laughs> can't even get into that, right? That was the best answer to any sports question ever. Still, to this day, I will go to my grave thinking this. Roy Firestone, the Pete Rose, usually, uh, you know, usually trying to get into like strange questions, different questions. So he says uh, to Pete, Pete, if you were a woman, what kind of woman would you be? And Pete, without hesitation, got to give him credit for being, uh, you know, uh, quick witted on this. He says an ugly one. <laughs> <laughs> Still a classic, man. Best thing Pete Rose ever said. I mean, the rest of what came out of his mouth, uh, you know, unfortunately, was a bunch of uh, very tainted uh information right now nah, i never bet a dime well what are you talking about pete we've seen you at the track man you leave, pete used to leave a stack of hundreds on the table and nobody would touch it because it was pete rose it was great 
All right, uh, well, we're going to come back with more in a moment here. John Kajemi going to join us. Always a pleasure having John. Brought to you by Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill. It's Mile Marker 104 on the Overseas Highway in Key Largo. It's getting late in the game there with this Tommy Fox. Uh, we're going to have to uh, make an inquiry today and see if we can't get that arranged. And uh, we'll be back with John in a moment. Now that. The time. 8 o'clock. Ponies in style at Champions, the outstanding simulcasting room at beautiful Hylia Park. Yes, the grand old lady of thoroughbred racing has never been more vibrant, and you can wager on the races from the top tracks around the country while enjoying a cocktail at the Brass Rail Bar or any of the fine food served throughout the facility. If poker is your game, you're covered in style, and you can play all your favorite Vegas-style games, including blackjack, craps, and roulette in Hylia Park's sizzling hot casino. Get a player's card when you walk through the door for all kinds of generous amenities, including our favorite, free play. When you come out to the ultimate casino and entertainment destination, Hylia Park. Hey folks, Tony Segretto here. You know, since day one, Catholic Health Services has been part of old school. And since we've started letting people know about them, it's changed their lives. You see, Catholic Health Services, while being recognized as one of the top places for stroke rehab in the country, it's also about a group of people who not just excel in what they do, from the doctors to the nurses to the therapists, on and on and on. It's how they do what they do every single day that separates them from the pack. They do it with a passion, unmatched, and the inclusion of family in every step of the process. Trust me when I tell you this. If you want the best unmatched rehab with a special group of skilled, caring people, there is truly only one place, and that one place is Catholic Health Services. These days, we're all looking for comfort anywhere we can find it. Thank goodness for Landlubbers, Raw Bar and Grill in the plantation location because they are making sure you are as comfortable as possible. First of all, they're not only open for delivery and pickup. All you have to do is go to landlubbersbarandgrill.com for both pickup and free delivery. Their hours have changed a little bit. Monday through Thursday from 3.30 to 10. And Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 11.30 to 10. You're going to have the best wings in the world. You're going to have a great burger. You're going to have... They're amazing soups. Again, Landlubbers, Raw Bar and Grill. It's nice and easy. Just go to landlubbersbarandgrill.com for both your pickup and free delivery. Thank goodness for Landlubbers for making you always feel right at home. We welcome to the show John Jemmy, who joins us for Dateline Dolphins. Uh, John, how are you, my friend? Depot, I'm doing well, and that's not the only thing that's going to reach a new height. I'll be at about 220, 225 after this football season if we visit too much. <laughs> down at uh, Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill. Grab a bagel and a schmear, plus some Defoe and Luby. Welcome back to the Defoe Show. All right, welcome back to the show. Uh, Jeff DeForest, Mike Luby Lubitz here on... South Florida Live, and uh, we usually do this on Mondays. Now, now is this uh, going to be an official change, uh, Luby, or is it just because we were off yesterday? Okay. Uh, but uh, we always want to feature John Kajemi on the show. Brought to you by Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill, mile marker 104 of the Overseas Highway in Key Largo. Uh, John, where are you, man? Uh, not able to make it on the uh, video today. Uh, are you traveling again and out there uh, doing some legitimate work? <laughs> Yes, it is legitimate. Yes, I can say that. I don't want to work. It's 50-50. I'm trying to work. But, yes, I'm on the road today. So uh, no no uh, video, just audio. And um, actually, I have to make a confession as well. I was down uh, this weekend at Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill. And I oh, wow. And I back back here at the homestead. But it was my brother's, Dominic's 50th birthday. So nice. I had a big celebration down at the Chill. and. Uh, it was awesome. I can't wait for you guys to get back down there. Uh, there wasn't uh, any sightings of one Tommy Fox at this celebration, was there? There was There was not a sighting of Tom Fox, no. no. Okay. So was there I, any mention of any future did. shows at, at uh, Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill, or uh, was the celebration so overwhelming uh, with enthusiasm that uh, <laughs> these minor business details were forgotten? That was discussed. So oh yeah! Oh good. Uh, we are. We do have. Uh, we have a full run of the place, and it's just up to us when we want to organize it and get down there. So all right, I think we're gonna we're gonna do that when uh, we'll try to time it up when uh, Coach Johnson's book is is out and or, or just going to be out. I, I got a preview of it while I was down in the Keys. Uh, it's awesome, uh, and uh, yeah, the place looked great. It was 
uh, great energy, just the way you would have imagined it uh, last time we were there. Uh, you know, Kiki Bar was was jumping. The games were on in the sports bar. I uh, stole a couple uh, slices of pizza uh, <laughs> as I was sliding through the kitchen. And uh, yeah, it was it was it was a great uh, weekend for my brother's birthday. So can't wait to get back down there with you guys. Well, my uh, appetite for getting back there is uh, tweaked even further, and uh, that'll be a lot of fun. And uh, Dave Hyatt, of course, uh, co-authoring the book with Jimmy Johnson, so a uh, good friend of the program, and we're hoping that uh, he can join us down there as well. And uh, and we have to get Mayo, uh, the gambling gourmet, to try that Italian fisherman pizza. What, what was that? Uh, one of the things that you swiped, or or is that no, so special that uh, you know it's hands off for uh, for the help? That's right. I do, I do have some decency to me, and I, I couldn't dive in for that just, you know, walking around. So yeah. that's the sit-down pie, right? That You have to sit down and really take that one in. So uh, I just yes. had a, a little pepperoni pizza. All right, very good. John Kajemi, uh, of course, with us. Uh, all right, uh, where do we begin? I, I, you know, I'm looking, and uh, the marquee game, of course, uh, coming up this week, one versus two, Tennessee and Georgia. Georgia, a, a heavy favorite. In that ball game, uh, considering well, they're home, but uh, they're also laying eight points to uh, Tennessee. I just uh, as I'm looking at this college schedule, which it's amazing now. You have Tuesday two games, Wednesday two games, Thursday two games, Friday two games, and with my sick friend Francesco calling in bets and me being forced to book them unconditionally, I have a feeling I'm, I'm booking eight games before we even get to Saturday's card. So uh, it, it is a proliferation uh, of uh, college football like we've never seen before. And the marquee game, one versus two, what, what, what do you think? I mean, Tennessee already knocked off Alabama in a thrill in Manila type of ball game. Can, can they do it again on the road against Georgia, John Kajemi? They can. They have the ability to do it. Uh, I don't know if they're going to pull it off, in, you know, at Georgia. Both of these teams are ranked in the top five in terms of total yards and, and, you know, passing yards and, and points, uh, you know, no one's scoring more points than Tennessee. They're close to 50 points a game. But you don't do that against Georgia in this defense. Now, I didn't think that would happen when Tennessee went up against Alabama. I thought it would be more of a slugfest, and that thing was like, you know, back and forth, and whoever had the ball last ended up winning the game. I, it might be that way, Tennessee and Georgia. But it might be that way more in the 20s or high 20s, low 30s. I don't, I don't see this game getting into the – both teams getting into the 40s unless, you know, everybody just lays down on defense. They're two good defenses. Uh, Georgia can put up points as well. Uh, so it, it, it's going to be a fun one. You know, it's going to be who can – you know, who can control those explosive plays because they have so many guys on, on either side with, with the quarterbacks that are playing in this game. And, and, and the wide receivers, they, they just have so much uh, downfield opportunity to come up with, with big plays. Whoever has it last again, like the Alabama-Tennessee game, may win this one. And Josh Heupel is one of those interesting sports stories, too, uh, where uh, you know, you're watching a guy play, and I, I remember as prominent of a college player as he was, when, when he got to the pros, I thought, wow, this guy really has a pop gun arm. I mean, he, he cannot throw the ball. And uh, was he not the quarterback in that Bears loss to Peyton Manning and the Indianapolis Colts uh, in, in the Super Bowl? Was Josh Heupel? Uh, no, he wasn't in that no, game. No, uh, I, thought, I thought it was the Florida quarterback. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to. I'm oh, Rex Grossman. Yeah. 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 Yes, okay. that's Grossman was also, I mean, uh, he, he was a little diminutive to. Uh, you know, be a pro quarterback, uh, although he supposedly had this Jeff George rocket of an arm, but uh, never really succeeded. Heupel, uh, you know, what was a dolphin briefly, I want to say also, was he not? Yeah, uh, I believe you're right. He was. And, and he couldn't throw the ball a lick. I mean, uh, and and you're thinking, all right, so that's the kind of guy that had a, you know, a brilliant college career. He, he doesn't make it as a pro. He sort of disappears, maybe becomes a successful businessman. Uh, maybe you see him like backing up Tony Robbins, some motivational uh, convention. Uh, but you know, he surfaces later on as a head coach in college and wow. I mean, he, he's on a magical ride though, with the, uh, Tennessee volunteers this year. Uh, although you say it's about to come possibly to an abrupt halt as, uh, you know, the reality awakens them that, uh, you know, they're, they're still not in Georgia's league. Well, well, we'll see, but hypo certainly is an interesting story. And, um, 
you know, I mean, uh, as you're looking at uh, Vince Dooley checked out, so you have another reason for uh, Georgia to be inspired. And is Kirby Smart, uh, where do you put him? I mean, uh, he's not often mentioned right away among the Nick Sabans and people talk about Jimbo Fisher, even though his team is bombing. But uh, where do you put Kirby Smart in the whole equation? And, and, and Heupel, for that matter. I, I think both guys, uh, they know how to coach their team, and, and they get the most out of what they do. I, I think Kirby on the defensive side of the football um, really is hands-on and is a, a motivator by uh, not only his brain, but his his voice. You know, his, his voice carries – um, and his demeanor and his excitement on the sidelines, it gets contagious for his defense. It gets contagious for that football team. And I think when, you know, Bennett, the quarterback, comes to the sidelines, he's either going to get an earful or he's going to get an arm around his uh, shoulder telling him, great job. So I, I think they know what to expect out of their coach. And Heifel on the other side, I think he's good. he was good for Tennessee because he brought his brand of up-tempo football to a team that needed an edge. They needed to have something different happen to them because for years you would look at Tennessee and their teams and say, man, getting off the bus, they look good. And then how'd they get beat 41-17, you know? How did that happen? Yeah. And they had the talent. They just didn't have a guy to orchestrate it all. And I think this is uh, this fits their DNA really well, what they do on offense, up-tempo. Uh, a lot of people wanted to come to Tennessee and it, right at the – NIL type of uh, era, you know, you have guys that were really good on other teams get to Tennessee and become even better than they were at other schools, uh, especially a couple of the receivers they have now. And and that, and you have a, a quarterback that played somewhere else and looked, you know, pedestrian, and now he looks like a Heisman Trophy candidate. So, uh, and, and, and I think Heifel and the offense had a lot to do with kind of, you know, mixing it all together and making the best out of what they have. John Kajemi with us here on, uh, well, with Pigskin Playbook, uh, also known as Dateline Dolphins. We'll get into the pros uh, as well. But, uh, you know, and, and this is always interesting for me because, uh, I mean, it, it was such a spirited thing uh, when uh, the Canes would take on Florida State for many years that I was doing broadcasting here on the local stations, uh, usually on a station that was uh, the flagship for Hurricane football, uh, originally IOD, then, then WQAM. And, uh, you know, so it, it, there was a, just a heavy concentration of interest in, in these games. And, and they were classics. I mean, uh, you know, there, there's so many moments that you can remember in flashbacks. But uh, not not feeling anything uh, about, you know, this Florida State-UM game, except that it's a chance for Florida State maybe to distinguish uh, Mike Norvell, uh, you know, being uh, well ahead uh, of where the Hurricanes are after originally, I mean, being so badly disparaged because he got off to such a slow start. And it looked like Florida State was going backwards instead of forwards. Mario Cristobal, on the other hand, I mean, I'm thinking this, John. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, all of these Mario apologists, I, I like Mario Cristobal just like everybody else. I, I'm rooting for him to succeed. I'm tired of seeing, uh, you know, the same storyline uh, being applied to the Hurricane football team that I had a great affection for and affinity for uh, when I was covering the team for many, many years uh, on a much more, you know, uh, a close uh, inside basis. And um, yet, all that being said, I mean, shouldn't they be better by supposedly Manny Diaz was a first time head coach? Uh, you know, I mean, still was a big question whether or not he was going to be able to handle a program. Uh, you know, that, that was uh, sort of downtrodden for a long period of time by their standards and, and then was trying to resurrect their way back to the top. Didn't do it. But you would think just by the fact that he's a better coach and has a better staff that this team would be performing at a better rate. Was that, and I'm going to use a little Jewish slang here, was that the worst piece of dreck you've ever witnessed as a football game in your many years of being involved in a sport and watching a sport? I mean, most people were saying that was the ugliest football game and the worst example of football they've ever seen, Miami and Virginia. Well, uh, God bless myself because I didn't, I didn't witness it. I didn't yeah. see it. I just looked at it on my phone. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it was one of those I, 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 I don't have to regurgitate in terms of, uh, you know, watching that thing and talking about it. But as I'm, as I'm looking at my phone and going, what, three, 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 nothing or three, three. Yeah. And then six, three. And, and then the cane seemed like 
they were in the red zone there forever. Uh, I don't know if it was my connection or my phone was yeah. just going on the fritz, but it just seemed like it sat there forever. And finally, you know, six six came up, and I, I was kind of you know get a sigh of relief, going, "Wow, the Canes were going to blow this one too." And they find a way to to win in I don't know what was it four overtimes maybe. Uh, um, yeah, I I. I I just don't know. I don't have any more uh, bad adjectives to describe um, what fans are feeling. You know, they they can't. They they just don't look cohesive now. And, and that at some point, that's got to be a reflection on the head coach, okay? Because for all the hype that Miami had going into the year, uh, you would think that yeah, okay, Virginia on a down year, Duke in a mediocre year. And they, they had every right to lose both of those games. And and now you're going to flash the U up at me and tell me that's, that's your team? Okay, <laughs> you know, that, good, yeah. good for you guys, you know. But, uh, yeah, the numbers just don't bear out uh, a mediocre team. I, I don't know if they're in the top 30 in any category or 40 for that matter, uh, especially on defense. On defense, they may not be in the top 100 in, in certain areas. You know, in total yards and passing yards and rushing yards and, and giving up points, uh, they're all, you know, 100 or worse in, in, in the country. Uh, that's terrible. And, and and they're lucky. I think they're lucky to be 4-4, four and four, to be quite honest with you. Now, oh, no Florida doubt. State, I think this is, this is a more important game for Florida State than it is Miami. And, and I say that because where's, you know, Neither team are going anywhere, but at least Cristobal is in his first year, and he he's going to get he's going to get roped. You know, he's going to get two or three years because they're paying him and his coaching staff so much money. You can't cut bait that quick. But for Florida State now, they've got to show that okay, even in a, in a bad rivalry matchup in terms of records and in terms of team, you have to be the the bigger brother in the state of Florida. You have to be able to beat Miami in a down year when you think you've got a pretty good football team. So it'll be imp- more important, I think, for Florida State to win this game than it would be for Miami, and that's saying a lot. Well, and, and John, uh, to stay with Miami for a second, um, I understand it's your one, and I understand he's got to, especially with offensive linemen, receivers, he got to bring his guys in. But the running back stable is supposed to be one of the best in the country. I mean, they – I, I can't even hate as an FSU fan. They literally have like six four stars in that running back room. And Florida State does not. Yeah, Florida State's running back room looks like one of the best in the country, and UM's doesn't. To me, that's supposed to be his calling card is running the ball. They can't run the ball. Tyler Van Dyke came into the season. Defoe was, wasn't was a joke. People listened to him when he was talking about Van Dyke being like 8-1 to one or 20-1. to one. 40 to 1 to win the Heisman. 40 to 1 as a Heisman. But looks like a him. good play. Yeah. You know, as a thing. He's now benched, and then Garcia, who was a top five quarterback coming out of high school, going to UM, uh, is a total disaster. And and these are things Cristobal had issues with at Oregon. Like offensively, he struggled. He now goes to UM with all this speed and some talent, and they're struggling. To me, I get it's your one, but like some of it is sort of just track record. <laughs> like, and when does that magically just change? I don't know. I, I don't think anybody knows at this point. Can you be? Can you imagine? The excitement, Miami fans, uh, you know, getting one of their own to come back and coach this team, and all of a sudden, you know, the, all the sports writers and, and the TV, you know, analysts and, and all the guys around the country picking Miami not only to win the Coastal, they're going to win the ACC, and they're going to be they're going to have a, an outside chance at, at a football playoff this year because of their quarterback and the new head coach and and all the recruiting success they've had and the pipelines getting uh, built up again because everybody wants to be part of the U. God, and they just, and they're still getting kids. They got yes. to get some Lakeland uh, to commit. I think it was last week we might have talked about it. Um, you know, a DB coming in. So, so th- that's going to continue to happen. Now, at, at some point you say, okay, we've got everybody we want and we've got the coach we want. We've got the assistants we want. What, what What's missing? You know, what, what, where are we falling short? The facilities have been upgraded. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, the alumni are still involved and they're coming back. And, you know, you've got, you've got Reed involved in terms of, um, you know, being on, 
on a daily basis in the building and, and motivating kids and telling them what how how it needs to to be at practice so they can do it on game day. Um, you've got everything in place and can't can't beat Virginia or, or barely beat Virginia and can't beat Duke at home. Man, that's that's got to leave a bitter taste uh, in your mouth. And I don't know if it changes. I really don't. I thought it was going to be one of those midseason uh, turnarounds for Miami where they, they have Duke and Virginia. You start building up some confidence. You win a, a rivalry type game. Uh, you get back over 500 and then you roll the rest of the way. Maybe it happens. I, I don't know. I, I don't see it happening uh, with, with, you know, as you, as you, get the feeling from UM that they're going to just stay kind of where they're at this year. Well, and, and you would also expect and anticipate that even though it's year number one, that you would see some kind of progression in the way the team performs. And uh, they've been so erratic. I mean, you were kind enough, uh, John, not to mention those hillbillies from Murfreesboro uh, yes. coming in here and beating the Hurricanes at Hard Rock Stadium, Middle Tennessee State, which subsequently uh, to that win, uh, you know, they got themselves pummeled. I mean, just absolutely uh, swatted like the clubbing of seals in, in, in their next couple of ball games. So it wasn't like they were some Appalachian state, uh, you know, that, that was uh, just underestimated because of the name of the school and uh, that, you know, you, you had hyphens in there. Uh, no, I, I would have expected to see more. I, I, I don't, Tony Segreto, you know, we all love him. He's painting this rosy picture, you know, and, and keeps going. It's year number one. I, I expected more in year number one. I, re I really did. I, I expected to see some kind of tangible evidence that this was a better coaching staff. And as Luby mentioned, I mean, you have a, a Heisman Trophy candidate on the bench and, and uh, a guy that was some stud uh, that came in there. And that, I mean, John, would you have run that ball? I, I don't know if you saw this play when they finally won a ball game on a two point conversion on the fourth overtime. And uh, Garcia, uh, you know, runs the ball into the corner and barely gets in. He has two guys in front of him that he could have thrown a ball to. And you're screaming at the television set, throw the ball, throw the ball. <laughs> and you're thinking, wow, that, that was like one of the dumbest, I mean, maneuvers I've ever seen. I mean, it could have cost the team the game. And uh, I did not. To, I didn't see that, Depot. I, like I said, I was I was kind of uh, out of the loop, but I was, I was looking yeah. at my phone for updates, and I finally saw – that they had won by two points, and it was my dad was in total confusion because he's he's you know eighty one years old. He he still has all his faculties, but he doesn't look a day over fifty. Was, cat. It, it, my, my dad's going. They they beat him with a safety in overtime. How did that happen? <laughs> and I go, well, Dad, I think they just go for you know two point conversions. And he goes, Oh, that's no way to end the game. What the hell is that? You know. So it, was, it ended it was great. It was, it was great comedy, but I'm sure, you know, U.S. fans were, were happy that they found a way to win. John Kajemi with us, uh, although uh, not on a visual, he's on the road uh, doing legitimate work. And uh, your, your dad has a little Cab Calloway kind of look to him, you know, where you could see him tap dancing yeah. and singing, you know, with, with a straw hat and a cane. Man, he, he's got that kind of vibe. I mean, just a, a world class uh, individual. Uh, all right. Uh, more likely to happen in your opinion, John and Jimmy, just to wrap up this whole thing on the Canes, which, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking here as we're speaking, well, I was spending like 15 minutes on this and uh, the team's become somewhat irrelevant. I mean, uh, in, in a short period of time, they, they went from, wow. I mean, uh, the eye popping catch of Mario Cristobal and we're bringing in Radakovich and uh, all, all of these stud coaches. Uh, they're finally paying assistance. I mean, uh, poor Art Keo, right? He never saw money like this uh, with uh, all of his dedication. Right. And, uh, you know, it, it can only get better because Manny Diaz wasn't equipped to do it, whatever. I mean, it just didn't work out. And, uh, you know, let him go back to being a defensive coordinator and, and, and probably have success there, right? Isn't he at Penn State? Is he Penn State? Yes. Yeah. He's he's coordinator? Good yeah. Good football. All right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's associated with, with uh, what, what's been a very, you know, uh, come back and become a, uh, a reasonably successful uh, program. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of crazy to think that we're still at the same point and, and, and looking at this track. Uh, more likely to happen, uh, Vanilla Ice to have another number one hit or the Canes to win another national championship. Oh, I'm, I'm thinking there's no chance of Vanilla Ice coming back with a number one hit. Uh, I mean, I don't even know if he's in the music business anymore. But what do you think? I mean, uh, I don't know. All, all, roads, all roads lead to Miami then, Depot, if, that, if, if that's the choice. Yeah. Yeah, but by I elimination. Don't think any anything like that is happening anytime soon. I, I really and do. Don't. You believe? I, I do you believe that? 
Uh, do you believe that FanDuel was responsible for the uh, rule change about overtime so that uh, these games that got into overtime, I mean, even at 6-6, there was always the possibility that you might hit an over of 57 points if they got to <laughs> overtime, which uh, now there's no shot, man. I mean, I couldn't even cover the three points with the Hurricanes winning because it is Fugazi new rule here. Uh, I, I don't know. What do you make of that, John, the, the, the change in the rule? I, I kind of liked it the way it was. You know, I, I didn't like when there was no overtime because I played in that era and played in a uh, uh, a couple of tie football games that you just felt yeah. like you didn't know, you, you just didn't know how to feel, right? And, and now at least there's an outcome where you have a winner or a loser. I didn't mind seeing uh, all those years ago when Texas A&M, I can't remember who they were playing, uh, but it went to like eight overtimes. And, you know, they kept going back to the 20 or 25 yard line. It was, you know, at least you ha- could run some kind of offense. You could get yeah. come down to gadget plays from the, from the, you know, inside the five yard line multiple times. So I, I kind of liked it the way it was. Um, this is okay. A- at least you get a winner, but I-, I liked it the way they initially had it. All right. Uh, we-, we need another description here and we'll get into the pros uh, and uh, the dolphin game, obviously. Uh, which turned out to be very exciting. I mean, down 14 zip against the Lions, <clears throat> excuse me, and they come back and, and, and win the ball game. And Tua, you know, was fantastic in spots. I, I love the way McDaniel is using uh, Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. I mean, they had spectacular games. Hill's been that way all season. Waddle, for the most part, all year long as well. Jacecki's back in the mix after he was uh, seemingly out of the picture. Mostert's running a ball effectively when they need to uh, get a few yards on the ground. I mean, uh, a lot of things were clicking there. The defense, unfortunately, wasn't as good. But uh, before we get into all of that, and a very interesting weekend all the way around in the pros. Uh, but I, I, this weekend that you had, wow, John, I mean, how, how great is that? You don't need any special occasion to go down there and enjoy Jimmy Johnson's big chill. What, what did you have overall? Did you just grab a couple of slices of pizza you said on the way out of the kitchen? But uh, did you sit down, any of that fine seafood? Uh, you know, what was, your, uh, what was your modus operandi when you were down there? Well, you know, for, for my brother and his 50th birthday, my mom actually cooked, and he wanted all homemade, all homemade food. So, oh wow, what he did was uh, my mom actually cooked lasagna, and she cooked sausage and peppers, and she she did the whole thing. I mean, it was it was spectacular. And uh, as we before dinner, obviously, I was gonna you know sneak into the kitchen and grab. Uh, a, a pizza, so I, I ended up having one of those pizzas down at Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill, which was spectacular, and uh, kind of just sat by the tiki bar and, and watched football. Watched uh, uh, some college football on the on the tube. Went upstairs, watched the Panthers uh, win, which, which was great against Ottawa at home, and and kind of kicked back and and just went on the rooftop at the end of the night and saw a spectacular sunset and had a couple cocktails and a cigar and, and kind of made it a night. So it wasn't, it doesn't get much better uh, when you're going to go down to key to the keys and, and stop in key Largo to, to just hop into Jimmy Johnson's big show, because between the Tiki bar and the sports bar and, and the, the residences there, it was just a, a phenomenal weekend. And, and I know that my brother enjoyed his 50th with his family and his friends. And, and we had a, a great time down there as well. That rooftop, uh, not recommended for Luby after watching a Miami Heat fall to two and five, uh, you know, to start the season. But uh, nonetheless, a spectacular place to take in the sunset there <clears throat> and a good vibe at Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill. All right, we'll come back. We'll talk some pro football with John Kajemi. And uh, John normally appearing as part of the video stream, audio only today. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, hopefully be able to catch up with him uh, next week because uh, always makes a great appearance here on the show. I would imagine uh, you were uh, all over TV uh, after that uh, and before that Dolphin game on uh, Sunday, so uh, we'll get your thoughts on that and uh, all of the other happenings around the National Football League, including, I mean, what, what seems to be a nosedive by uh, two of the greatest quarterbacks of all time, right? Aaron Rodgers, so all of a sudden he's handing the ball off on every play uh, as they got throttled by the Bills, who looked really, really good in every ball game they played, except they did lose to Miami and, uh, it, you know, had uh, a lot of other uh, interesting things. Geno Smith resurrection a great story there the giants have been a good story the jets with zach uh, hack wilson my god but uh, screwed on a call like i've never seen uh, and don't start calling in and say, hey you're a homer for the jets you sold souvenirs there you're a schmuck 
Nothing to do with that. I mean, uh, the, these horrendous roughing the passer calls are, are really uh, something that should come into question. More with John Kajemi in a moment here on the Defo Show. Mike Luby Lubitz, Jeff DeForest, back with more in a moment. Now that. The time. It's 8.30. Folks, Tony Segreto here. Let me ask you a question. What do you look for when you go out to eat? Good food, obviously. Friendly atmosphere. Not too loud, but good energy. Reasonable prices. And a place where you feel comfortable. All those ingredients, no pun meant there, are hard to find unless you're talking about the Texas Roadhouse. You see, they encompass all of those attributes. Really, really good food, amazing atmosphere, good for a family, good for a date, or just a night out for yourself, and prices that will make you extremely happy. Their ribs unmatched, steaks hand cut every day, everything, and I mean everything is made on site, including their incredible bread. It's the one day, folks, that you can forget about low-carb diets. Trust me when I tell you, Texas Roadhouse, your restaurant, your destination, when you say, where should we go and eat tonight? From the newly renovated sports bar to the beautiful bayside views captured at the Tiki Bar, Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill has it all. Located at mile marker 104, the Big Chill also offers waterfront dining while experiencing breathtaking sunset views of the Florida Keys. It's simply the hottest spot in the Keys to cool off. That's Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill at mile marker 104 in Key Largo. For more information, call today at 305-453-9066. Jimmy Johnson uh, joins us here on the program, along with John Kajemi, and it's Dateline Dolphins, of course. Hey, Coach, you were talking about, you know, different ways you can motivate guys, different ways to talk to guys, talking about Brian Floor, and I think – just listening to him talk to his team, I think it resonates with a lot of guys. I think that's an important ingredient if you're sitting in the room and you actually believe with a guy that man is telling you that's your head coach. How did you feel about that, your message resonating with your team? You know, Johnny, at any level, I think you're exactly right. I've never been a dreamer, I've never dreamed about stuff because if you dream, that means you got your fingers crossed and you're hoping. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but I believe, you know, when we were at University of Miami, the graduation rate was right about 50%, which that's about what the student body is. And and so, you know, I looked at it and we were recruiting these inner city kids. And from day one, I talked to them about when they got their college degree. You know, if you really believe in something, John, it's part of your personality. My personality was, hey, these guys are college graduates. We were one in 15 in Dallas, and I took my guys out, Tony and Dave and Butch and all that crew. We went to a little restaurant, and I said, guys, just hang with me. I told you we are going to win a national championship when I was at Oklahoma State. Now, we had to go to another university to do it, but we won it. I said, hang with me. We're going to win a Super Bowl. We operated as if we were going to win a Super Bowl. It wasn't hoping. It wasn't dreaming. It was believing, and I think that if that's your personality, it carries over to the players. Right. It carries over to the assistant coaches. That's the way they deal with the players. And, hey, after a couple of years, all of a sudden, these players are believing they're going to win it. I think that motivates the average player to be a good player. The best way to kick off your day is with Defo plus Luby. We now return to the Defo Show. Welcome back to the show. Good to be with you here. Uh, had a day off yesterday. Glad you guys joined us here today and found us again on South Florida Live, the Defoe Show uh, with Mike Luby Lubitz. I'm Jeff DeForest. Uh, that man is Luby on the other side of your screen. And joining us on the phone lines today, uh, John Kajemi with his pigskin playbook, also known as Dateline Dolphins. Uh, all right, John, uh, I know you were focused in on this uh, Dolphin game, as you are every week, uh, as part of the uh, Dolphins uh, analytical team there on CBS Sports and uh, various other platforms uh they're trailing detroit 14 to nothing uh you'll find it surprising i was at a prayer mutual facility uh, <laughs> indulging a, in a little horse racing uh wagering on sunday even though it was a beautiful day and most people would say great day to be at the beach but uh i managed to go out there and lose the money uh, back that i had won on uh friday uh, but yet uh, out of the corner and one of the screens is a dolphin game and, and people are flipping out man saying can you believe this they were down 14 to nothing to Detroit. Now, we know it's Detroit, and Detroit have been getting clobbered in their last couple of ball games after being very competitive. Uh, you're wondering how much longer they go with Dan Campbell. Uh, they did make a move, I believe, yesterday that was kind of tantamount to a baseball team firing the batting coach, the hitting coach, when, when uh, you know, something goes wrong. They fired the defensive backs coach. And um, 
You know what? I, I don't know that the coach would have had much argument after that game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, uh, right. what, what were you thinking when they were down fourteen zip? I mean, uh, what, where was uh, you know where was your mindset at at the time? I I was in the mindset of man, please don't let them lose on the road to Detroit because this is a team that didn't shoot straight the last couple of weeks, but their offense uh, the first four weeks of the season was actually pretty good. Yes, and over players rejoicing. And, and, yes, yeah, and and Detroit gets out to the fourteen to nothing lead, and then they go up twenty one seven at some point as well. Yep. But you had the feeling Miami offensively wasn't going to be stopped. This was going to be a high scoring game, and Miami was going to keep scoring. They just had to find a way to get off the field on defense, and they finally did that in the second half. You know, Detroit was was pretty good in the first half on third down. I think they were four of six. In the second half, they were over. You know, they threw a donut on third down, and that really turned the game around. And Miami kept pouring it on on offense. And Tua Tunga Bailoa was spectacular in that game. I mean, anytime you have Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle uh, combining for 20 catches and, and almost, you know, 300 yards, uh, you're going to win games. You're going to be in games, and you're going to outscore 90% of the NFL. And they were able to do that. Uh, I just thought that, you know, this is one of those things that Miami's going to have to, Miami's going to have to get out of their own way in terms of penalties because that's oh been creeping God. in a little bit. It was 12 in the um, first half. You know, they won't, yeah, they had seven <laughs> penalties, but they had about nine of them that were declined. Yeah, no, there was like 15 penalties. So, you know, against the Buffalo or against, you know, somebody like, San Francisco or the Chargers down the road, that doesn't get it done. But if you can do it against Detroit and Chicago next week and overcome it because you're so good on offense, okay, you use those as learning, uh, learning, you know, tapes and and go back and, and Monday and Tuesday you have off and you come back on Wednesday and you go, okay, we can't do that again. But I, I thought this was probably one of the better games that Mike McDaniel called as a coordinator and head coach for Tua. They moved the pocket well. And they did a lot of things that they, they do every week in terms of motion, but they got matchups that they liked, and they really wore out Hill and Waddle and found Kasiki in the red zone, which has been a, a, a nice find for this team. You know, he, he's not a blocking tight end as much as they want to try to convert him. He's not going to do it, so don't ask him to do it. Put him in a two-point stance and let him get open inside the 20 and you're going to win most battles. So um, they, they found a way to, to mix in a little bit of run with a lot of you know, explosive passing and Hill and Waddle just can't be covered as the candle. Well, John, and it was, you talked about it early in the year. You said the defense will have to carry them because the offense should get there, but it might take time with a whole new offense with a lot of new parts. And we actually saw early in the season, them starting to heat up and then Tua got hurt. So last week was sort of the Tua getting back. And yesterday it looked like that offense that we had seen um, early in the year. And I get it, Detroit's defense is not good. But still, you know, like it was nice to see them look like that. The Steelers' defense had been up and down and they struggled last week. So it was nice to see them look good. The problem is, what the hell is going on with the defense? And I get it, no Byron Jones. And I get it, secondary's hurt. The defensive line isn't. The defensive line, you, you re-sign Agba. Phillips has a great rookie year. Ingram you bring in. They don't get pressure at all. And the, the second half, they sort of started to wake up. But, I like, Jared Goff is immobile. Their offensive line's pathetic. And he was standing back there all day. And I'm just losing it. Like, what's going on, guys? Like, where's Phillips? Where's Ingram? Where Agba? Like, I, and this has sort of been a pattern. Like, they've struggled to get pressure on quarterbacks this season. Yeah, you, you know, I was thinking the same thing. And, and I feel like Josh Boyer, the defensive coordinator, I don't know if he's uh, he's probably afraid to send, yeah, uh, you know, an extra linebacker, Jerome Baker, or send Javon Holland again because Brandon Jones is out yeah. and yeah. Xavier Howard isn't a hundred percent. And you've got Noah Igbenogany. Whether you're going to flip a coin to say is he going to have a good day today or a bad day today? <laughs> um, you know, uh, you know, you have Bethel in the back there. You've got Campbell back there. You got a, a bunch of guys that you didn't plan on having uh, in the secondary. And now they've played a lot of football, so they should be ready to, to kind of, you know, pin their ears back and go up with the front seven and, and put guys in man coverage and be okay. 
But I think you, you walk a fine line going, okay, we really want to, let's not make it easy for them and give them the easy chunk yardage play. Let's make them earn it a little bit more because our offense is going to outscore them. We just want to be able to stay on the field, stay on the field, and, and be able to bend and not break. And eventually they were able to be good enough up front because Zach Steeler got his hands on the football a couple times. He got a, the only sack of the game. Somebody had to come through, and that was, you know, big 92 up front. Yep. But you're right. Galen Phillips, and and you're, you're hoping that somebody's going to able, be able to put pressure on the in the pocket. Melvin Ingram, Van Ginkle, you know, Ogba. It just hasn't come with a lot of consistency, and you're hoping that that changes over the Chicago, Texans, Cleveland, bye week scenario that when they get hit the road uh, out in California and you have San Francisco, the Chargers, and Buffalo, you know, three weeks straight, that's going to be the season for the Dolphins. Yep. If they can do what they're, take care of business over the next, uh, I don't know, three weeks to month and then get ready for that, that stretch at the end. Certainly accomplished something that we've been looking for for years, and that is, uh, no matter what, at least try to be exciting. Exciting. Uh, you know, the, the best part of uh, the season, I, I think, is that the uh, Dolphins' attempt at criminal activity failed because they would look entirely different if they had a downtrodden uh, and now divorced Tom Brady <laughs> and uh, maybe soon to be a detached uh, Tom Brady uh, with the losing ways of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers <laughs> and Sean Payton as their head coach because uh, – you do have to say, I mean, in assessing McDaniel and as critical as we were about uh, what seemed like a real bonehead coaching decision not to go for the field goal in a ball game and opting to go for a fourth and two uh, at the 14-yard line in the third quarter instead nearly cost them a game against a Pittsburgh team that's kind of staggering uh, offensively. So uh, should should be, you know, uh, one that you could count on getting a win in. Uh, and, and they barely did. I mean, they, they had to survive, uh, unfortunately, your man Kenny Pickett uh, which uh, it, it, was his name changed? Was it re- originally like Kenny Stewart, and they just put the pick in there? Because wow, he is struggling well, I, with those uh, throws in the pros. Yeah, yeah. I, but, I, uh, I, I go ahead. So I, I think he's going to end up being a pretty good quarterback um, in terms of being able to throw it downfield and and being mobile enough. And I think he's going to be okay. Uh, yeah. We were very fortunate in that game that. Um, the Pittsburgh Steeler defense had, you know, Roberto Duran hand yep. and, yes. and really oh, dropped, yeah. you know, three or four the other way. So, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, we snuck out of there. We got what we deserved. We were a better team than the Steelers, but yeah. we were very fortunate to, to come out with a, a W in that game. Well, and, and then, uh, you know, you're looking at some of the other games, uh, and that was uh, to his first game back, and, and he, he wasn't particularly sharp. Uh, in this game, he was razor sharp for the most part, but uh, you do have to like the way, and, and we haven't had this uh, here, this feeling here since Clayton and Duper for sure. Uh, it's hard to get a tandem of wide receivers that are as exciting as Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell. And, and had the original plan worked out, where we would be watching, watching, you know, a, a, I mean, a, you know, a grinding to a halt Tom Brady, uh, you know, uh, seeing his career possibly end on, you know, almost a Joe Namath type of note, where he's sitting on a Rams helmet there, a broken man. Uh, and, uh, and Sean Payton and, and, and McDaniel has really done a good job of, of opening things up and making use of these two guys. I mean, it's dynamic. And, and I have to say, I love the uh, Waddle celebration with the Waddle because it looks like me coming down a short flight of stairs here in the townhouse. <laughs> John, I hope this doesn't happen to you where you start to waddle, uh, just, just when you're walking around. No, I, I, it takes a while. I, I do that shuffle about 3.30 in the morning going to the bathroom. Yeah. I, I do the waddle. Yeah, I'm day. with you. That, that's, I mean, yeah. but no, no, I mean, it's dynamic what they have going on offense. And, and when it's clicking like that, uh, you know, and then you're looking at these wide open kind of run pass option plays for Tua. And, uh, you know, Tua, who was a little reluctant to take off last year uh, under Brian Flores, uh, is more than willing to just go head first into a dive and, uh, you know, seems to be enjoying the fact that, uh, you know, the offense is more to, uh, you know, to his skill set than it was before when they were trying to make him something that he wasn't uh, a drop back passer. Tua is, is, in, is reaping the benefits of, of a well schemed offense that has two of the most dynamic players in the National Football League running routes. And they don't even have to run the routes uh, perfectly to, to get this space 
that uh, no other team has the luxury, no other pass offense in the NFL has the luxury of, of, of catching passes with so much room. And people are always asking, you know, can the Dolphins, can, can these two receivers get better? And I say, yes. How many times have you seen Tyreek Hill or Jalen Waddle catch a ball in stride and, and get yards after catch? Not much. They're catching it where they're, I mean, if you if you remember, if you can just go back and, and look at Gates, there's so much space where they're catching the ball. And yeah. I'm not so sure if they're running the correct, you know, routes at the correct depth and the right steps and the, doing the right thing. Because if they catch it on the run, they're going to get 40 or 50 more yards a game. They're catching the ball and falling down. While he's catching the ball, he's wide open. There's no one around him. He's jumping in the air and just falling down 22 yards down the field. You know, if Tyreek Hill doesn't have to stop every go route and two yeah. just throws one out there, he's going to have an 80-yard touchdown instead of a 45-yard completion. So there's more in this offense, and there's more plays to be made. But the plays they're making now with the room that they create because of their space and the fear and the scheme that's involved in these in this in this offense, there's not there's not one team in the National Football League, I guarantee you, that has the room between the linebackers and the safeties in the middle of the field that than the Miami Dolphins have. Remember when you were playing in the sandlot, John, and you would see the guy that was gonna back off uh, the wide receiver that was uh, flushed out there to the right. And uh, he was yeah. going to give him like a 15 yard cushion, and his first five steps were backwards anyway. Yep. Uh, I mean, that, that's why it's not like Mike Haynes and Lester Hayes are out there lining up against Hill and Waddle. I mean, I'm watching Detroit; they're, they're they're 10 yards off the line of scrimmage, and they're backing up, they're backpedaling right away. So, I mean, there is a lot there, and and, and Tua happens to excel at throwing it underneath, uh, you know, kind of mid range ball. So, uh, and he's getting it out and, and releasing it quickly when he does drop back to pass. So, uh, a lot of good things. I mean, you know, we, we were talking about coaching with, with Mario Cristobal and how the team should look better. But, I mean, uh, McDaniel really has done a great job of uh, kind of releasing Tua from uh, the shackles that he experienced there, which, which I think also led to more of his mental mistakes. You know, when, when you're, you know, playing uh, out of your element there and you're trying to make you something that you're not. And, uh, and, and Waddle and Tyree Kill, I mean, they, they couldn't be any better. It's great. Yeah, the, the good thing that McDaniel also is doing, guys, is he's masking the offensive line really well. The ball's yeah. coming out quickly. They're, they're able to run it. I mean, they're probably running three or four running plays, but they're doing it out of different motions. They're doing it out of different looks. And I, I think Moster is, is utilizing that top line speed that he has. I mean, remember, you've got three track guys, basically, in, in football uniforms that are, that are better football players than maybe they were track guys and they were terrific on the track most are gets to top speed right away so he's masking you know little creases that are uh, up front and with the play action and the ball coming out quickly I, I think that McDaniel is doing a nice job of putting Tua in a in an area where he's going to excel you know 10 out of 10 so you know now you lose Eichenberg up front so Jones is probably going to slot in at left guard you've still got Shell who you know, we haven't mentioned him at right tackle, and that's a good thing because he's playing seamlessly for Jackson. So it looks like Art Shell, man. Yeah, he really does. Yeah, right. So the only Jackson. the only roadblock that's coming are the Boza brothers. You know, in back to back weeks, um, you know they can start to feast on on a line that might be, you know, not as as strong uh, as, as some of the offensive lines that that you probably would have had for the Miami Dolphins. I think Armstead. Holding up, I mean, he's not practicing. Don't practice the rest of the year. Who cares? As long as he plays on Sunday, the Dolphins are going to take that, and he's healthy. So, you know, Good. that's the only that's the only area of concern. You know, if Armstead were to falter and with the toe injury, now you're really looking at three positions that you have to, you know, cross your fingers at because you're hoping to get Austin Jackson back at one of them within the next, you know, week to ten days. Well, I'm sure Diva wants to move to the rest of the NFL. We love to cover it all with you, but I just want to ask one more thing yeah. because Dolphins and you, it's funny you, and that's why we respect you and love having you on because you're very honest about the Dolphins and you sort of lamented much like me, the fact that they won't draft a freaking running back outside of the sixth round. Like they have these guys and it's improved in most certain Edmonds, but Edmonds have been sort of disappointing. Um, and after that, it's nothing. And they're supposedly in talks with the 
Browns for Kareem Hunt and possibly an offensive lineman, which a few years ago I would have been happy after his off-the-field stuff and his on-the-field play. I don't know what to think about with Hunt. The guy that was traded yesterday is the guy I wish the Dolphins would have gone after. Roquan Smith is literally the definitive thing the Dolphins need, playmaking linebacker. What are your thoughts on the idea that Dolphins are actually buyers at the trade deadline, which I don't think they've ever been in the last 20 years, and some of the guys that they're sort of being talked about flirting with? You know, I, I it makes sense for the Dolphins to package somewhere in there an offensive lineman. Yes, please. I don't know if they'll do it or not. Um, they probably need to, but it has to be beneficial, uh, not, not just in the short term, but in the long term. Because this is a team right now that I, I think they can score at will. And I, I think they're worried, you know, if Armstead's going to be able to hold up, right? They've gotten them through, okay, to almost to the midpoint of the season right now. Yeah. And he hasn't missed a whole lot of time, which is good. I think they did a nice job of planning ahead to say, you know what, we're not going to practice him. We're just going to play him. And he's going to have to be the pro that he is and, and be able to get work in on the side without really taking all those reps. And I think it's worked out for not only him, but the football team. Are they buyers? Yeah, I think they are buyers. There has to be the right. I don't think they're desperate buyers. You know, at five and three, they've got a good chemistry with the guys they have right now. They know their deficiencies, and one of them is probably, you know, up front on the offensive line. And probably plan B is to have a guy they have confidence in in the backfield. Uh, they they like Mostert. They like Edmonds. Uh, after that, Ahmed and and Miles Gaskin they trade off and on being, you know, being up or down on the roster. So I don't, I don't know if they're going to do pull the trigger in terms of being able to make a play there. I mean, it sounds great if they could do that with, with the Browns, but I, I don't know. I don't know if they do it if, if they feel like they're losing out and giving up too much in the deal. John Kajemi with us here, uh, Pigskin Playbook, Dateline Dolphins, uh, brought to you by Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill, mile marker 104, the Overseas Highway in uh, Key Largo. All, all right, uh, expanding to some other stories here. I, I, I'm sure you can appreciate this, and, and it's odd, too, because uh, Chicago is coming off uh, its best game in a long time, and they go into kind of tank mode now, or trading off uh, good players and, and uh, making it known that uh, others are available. Uh, Carolina, they fired uh, Matt Rule. And have they won like two in a row? I think they won again this past week, or at least they were they yeah, leading you know in a ball they game. They got beaten overtime against the Falcons. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Oh, oh, that was an get in. That yeah. Was, yeah, that was an odd game, and the guy takes his helmet off, and uh, subsequently they missed the uh, what would have been the game-winning extra point. Boy, it goes yeah. to overtime, and they lose. That that was that was a crazy game, also. But what a catch uh, by that kid, uh, Moore, uh, over the top there. That that was a great great play, and and his quarterback's kind of an interesting story. They're in Carolina, but uh, they're also, I mean, in tank mode, and they, they traded. I love this uh, this McCaffrey story where he's the first guy to have the scoring trifecta since, like, 2004, LaDainian Tomlinson, where he throws for a touchdown, runs for a touchdown, and catches a touchdown pass. And I, I thought that was great. I mean, they're, they're just integrating him into the offense there in San Francisco. Uh, you got to love that, the way they incorporated uh, McCaffrey into the game. I, I thought that was one of the real good feel-good stories of the week. Yeah, I, I, you got to love that. I mean, he's a player, right? He can do it all. Yeah. He could do it all by throwing it, catching it, running it. Uh, and what a fit for that offense because they've got some players on the perimeter. And now you have a guy that not only runs the football well between the tackles because he knows how to contort his body and find that little crease to, to get out of the back end of, of, of the offensive line and all that traffic, but he catches it so well out of the backfield and can make the first guy miss. So you don't always have to push the ball down the field. Touchdown sometimes is your best offense to play, just getting him the football in space. So, yeah, he fits that offense to a T. Oh, it's great, too. And all of the scoring plays were, you know, spectacular. I mean, the pass was perfect. You can appreciate that as, uh, you know, naturally a guy making a double move when the ball's being pitched to McCaffrey. Uh, you have a good chance that the defensive back is going to come up and try and stop the run or be taken in by it anyway. Uh, the running play uh, he made was from like 20 yards out a and the catch was uh, terrific. I mean, uh, in traffic there, not, not the greatest pass from Garoppolo, three guys uh, all around him. And he just like leaps up out of nowhere and makes the catch. So that was great. Uh, a good feel, good story. What, what happened to the Rams, man? Uh, what's I, I had them repeating as NFC champions. Uh, 
I, I feel like a fool here, uh, John Kajemi. Why am I so stupid about that? What a disaster. Oh, uh, you know what? Everybody probably had the Rams getting back and, and having a chance to get back to to a Super Bowl, but uh, I don't know. They they just look listless on offense, and yeah, you know, it's funny that when you have a, a quarterback that had such great success coming from a a team where his individual numbers were great, but the team's success was bad, you have a spectacular season and you kind of catch lightning in a bottle and you, and you do it and you win it all, and then you come back with great expectations and. You just don't have that it factor. You don't have that difference maker. You, you, the offense just isn't gelling, and the Rams are—you know—they they have no answers right now on, on either side of the football. The 49ers put up, you know, 31 points against what was going to be one of the premier defensive fronts and defenses in the National Football League. So it, I, I think it's just not on offense. The Rams are kind of looking around for answers, and, and none to be found anytime soon. Now, it's funny, another feel-good story, uh, but uh, one of the uh, many Dolphins that I became uh, sort of friendly with uh, over the years was uh, Pete Stojanovic, uh, the kicker, who, who was, uh, you would have to say, a, a very uh, accomplished kicker, uh, very competent. You felt pretty, uh, you know, sure that, except for that one kick in San Diego, that uh, Pete was going to be reliable. Uh, and, and I remember he shanked one against the Jets when Pete Carroll was uh, defensive coordinator of the Jets. And a famous incident, of course, uh, Pete came out there on the field, was making a choke sign as Stoyer was coming off the field. And I don't know if Danny ever spoke to you about this, Dan Marino, who you're uh, much closer to than I was to Pete. But, uh, I mean, uh, he he led a rally that was impossible in that game. I, I believe it was a Monday night football game or it, it was one of the uh, late night attractions uh, in the NFL. And, uh, I mean uh, – it seemed like he, he just took it personally, that, that whole Pete Carroll choke sign. I bring this up for a reason, but did, uh, did Danny ever mention that uh, he, he was especially motivated to go ahead and, and put one on the New York Jets uh, on that occasion? Because uh, he, he led a no. comeback that seemed impossible. I have to ask him about that one because uh, I do remember that game. Yeah. And I, I, don't re- I, I don't recall him ever saying anything like that, but I, I – Try to, I'll try to remember to ask him about that one. That, that's interesting. Yeah, you're right about uh, Pete, though. He was money. He was money yeah. in his career. Well, and, and I could see, uh, you know, Dan Marino taking that personally and just saying, you know what? Fuck you, Pete Carroll, man. We're going to win this game now. <laughs> like, you're, you're not yeah. going to do that in our house. You don't come to Las Vegas and talk to a man like Mo Green like that, Pete. But I, I bring this up because uh, Pete Carroll, I, I think, is part of one of the real feel-good stories in the NFL this year, the Seattle yes. Seahawks. And, and I, I'm, you know, in, in spite of that, and, and I took a zillion calls about what an asshole Pete Carroll is over the years from Dolphin fans. But uh, in spite of that, I'm kind of a Pete Carroll fan. And I, I know he had the uh, blunder there with Marshawn Lynch that everybody blames him for, but I, I don't even blame him for that because I, I thought it was just like an amazing play by Malcolm Butler that, uh, you know, the guy's open, the play's going to work, and next thing you know, you lose the Super Bowl. But uh, that being said, I mean, the, the job he's done with Geno Smith and, and, and the Seahawks this year, I mean, would make him a coach of the year candidate. They, they were supposed to be like 0-8 at this point. I, I can't believe the turnaround because every time you see a um, a Seattle highlight, it's Geno Smith going downtown to, to a receiver, right? And it's the passing yeah. game, and then all of a sudden you flash to the sideline, and, and Pete Carroll, just, you know, it looks like he, he's got like 17 Gumby Bears he just got from the, the pot <laughs> shop in the street. <laughs> just showing the way it's home, right? They're way advanced there, too, in Seattle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it, it just looks like he's having fun. You know, as one of the older coaches in the National Football League, he always seems like he's having fun on the sidelines. Yes. But especially this year with a, a team that no one gave a chance to, and he seems to be thriving in that underdog role. Um, you know, we don't have a quarterback. Russell Wilson goes somewhere. We've got Geno Smith, who hasn't really done what he was projected to do in the National Football League. And all of a sudden, you know, sitting for a few years and watching how it's done at a high level, may have helped Gino in his progression this year because he looks like he's been doing it for a long time. And Seattle is one of the feel good stories in the national football. League. I, I kind of like this too, you know, where, uh, you know, I mean, Pat Riley uh, in interviews uh, would agree that that 50 win season he had with like really lousy players, 
uh, you know, it was maybe his best coaching job in spite of all of the, uh, you know, illustrious accomplishments uh, with the Lakers. And, uh, you know, he did a good job with the Knicks and, and of course, down here with the Miami Heat. Uh, but, you know, when uh, the mark of a good coach to me, John, is a guy, you know, that maybe has had some accomplishments like Pete Carroll. And yet here he's got a nothing team and he's able to win with them. I mean, we, we gave a little bit of this credit to Brian Flores uh, when he was coaching here, although uh, I, I think we're far better off actually with McDaniel so far this year uh, working that type of personnel than a guy that was going to tell two every day that he stinks and uh, he wishes he would go back to Hawaii or something. But uh, I mean, that, that's really the mark of a good coach that could take like a, a you know, a team that's supposed to be garbage and, and have them what at five and three, they were top the division with this and a quarterback too, who, I mean, how, how good of a story is Gino? How, how the hell did this happen? But where Gino Smith, who, uh, you know, you'd given up for dead many years ago and, and he nearly was, I mean, he was knocked out. The guy had brass knuckles, uh, hit him in the face, uh, you know, in the jets locker room while Rex was laughing in the background. And you figure that guy's never going to make it in the NFL. And, and here he is having a great season. Well, sometimes all it takes is a little confidence by the guy that's in charge, and it filters down through your quarterback and it gets to the entire team. Uh, you know, look, you, two perfect examples. I mean, the situation Tua was in, would you ever think he would turn in to what he is? Now, maybe it has all to do with getting uh, two guys that can run better and catch better and, and do things at a higher level than anybody else in the National Football League as a tandem. Yeah, that helps. But his improvement individually has, has been enormous. And Gino the same way. I mean, just a little bit of confidence uh, can go a long way in a, in a team that maybe fits what they're doing. Um, boy, two offenses that you didn't think were going to have a whole lot of, of that type of success. I think both quarterbacks are playing at a much better level. And, and the guys around them, uh, obviously, in, in Tua's case, he has two of the best wide receivers in the National Football League. And, and for Geno Smith to, to have a winning record at this point when everybody said that they were the worst team in that division, it, it says a lot for each individual and, and the coaching that they're getting. All right, John, make a couple of phone calls uh, with Tommy Fox uh, missing an action there. Oh. Uh, you know, you're in touch with the people down there. Jimmy Johnson's big chill. Let's make some arrangements when Jimmy's around. Like uh, and uh, and get down there and do a show. It doesn't have to be uh, on a Monday necessarily. Well, whatever day we can do it, we'll, we'll be happy to get down there and uh, hopefully everybody can make it. But uh, we might put a little more responsibility. I know you're working a real job and, and you have all of this TV responsibility with the Dolphins. But can uh, you put it on your social calendar to, uh, you know, maybe try to spark and expedite the arrangements to get down there to Jimmy Johnson's big show? I will do I will do my best. Guys. I've already uh, spoken to the, the Larry and Dominic and Amanda down at the Big Chill, and uh, oh, cool. they're all thumbs up. So all right, cool. uh, it's it's kind of on us to, to reach out whenever we feel like uh, is the best time to go, and and we'll we'll set it up. Two weeks. Yeah. All right, yeah, next couple of weeks, uh, we'll we'll have to get down there and do that. Uh, and uh, Jimmy's book's coming out pretty yeah. soon, uh, Swagger with Dave Hyde. So uh, that, that's going to be a spectacular. We have to feed Mike Mayo the Italian fisherman pizza. Sarni might even yeah. uh, Jim Sarni might even dive in for a slice. Although he's likely to just take all the seafood and shovel it off on a side plate <laughs> and then just eat because he says he's just a red sauce and cheese guy, man. He doesn't go for all of this uh, fancy schmancy stuff. But um, I, I think we can change his mind because that's what we're all about. We're about I making people so. yeah, put them in a position to have a better life. And, and that's what's going to happen at Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill. John, always a pleasure, my friend. Thanks uh, for being with us. Uh, you know, enjoy the rest of the day. And uh, we'll talk to you again next week, my friend. Hey, sounds good, guys, and enjoy the week. Talk to you next week. Thanks, John. All right, John Kajemi, ladies and gentlemen, the Big Skin Playbook, brought to you by Jimmy Johnson's uh, Big Chill. All right, uh, that's going to do it for us for today, although uh, we will be uh, making a live appearance in Boca Raton, Florida, right? Home of the Gucci bag. And uh, we'll be there. Uh, maybe I'll stuff a Gucci bag full of leftovers there from uh, Louis Bossies. <laughs> and the lunch we're going to have with Mike Mayo, who's been on fire, by the way. On fire. I mean, winning at everything he does. He'll still be fetching about it, but uh, oh, winning it. Every, I mean, he, he's sending me copies of and, and and it's so minuscule to print. Uh, does he send you a copy of his winning tickets, which would mean nothing to you? <laughs> no, he actually leaves me off those texts, which I really appreciate. <laughs> I know you can enlarge it, but I mean, does it have to look like the bottom line of the uh, eye test at the DMV? Are those cues or is that dust on the uh, little lens here? I can't tell, lady. 
they, they give you a free pass on that, right? Because they deliberately put like, uh, you know, a machine there that has that one speck of dust that looks like a comma. <laughs> STP. And, and a lady looks at you and says, what do I look like? Andy Granatelli? What, what, what the fuck are you talking about, STP? It's R yeah, you're not- UV. <laughs> you blind bat. You want a license? Okay, no problem. And then they... The rubber stamp with a picture of Ron DeSantis. <laughs> How much of a fool does Charlie Chris feel like when the, the opponent isn't even in the state campaigning? Yeah. He's so much of a lock that he's out campaigning for other guys in other states, other maniacs. Unbelievable. All right. Uh, get out there and vote, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be doing it on Tuesday. I, I have such a convenience on voting. It's not even funny, Louie. Because my voting place now is the church that is right next door to the property that I'm, I'm living at. Nice. So I li- I literally walk like like uh, it's less than my walk of Skippy nice. to get over there, and Skippy loves taking a dump at the church parking lot. He, he just does. <laughs> I look around, you know. Sometimes I'll feign picking it up. I don't know if he did it on the. I, what what is that, Luby? I mean, I I think it gets him closer to God. Certainly, the holy water he spreads there. <laughs> But there's no excuse, and uh, and there's no line either, because uh, like nobody nobody votes anymore, right? Are they all doing on early voting? Is that the way it works? I I do early voting. I think no one's voting. I think that's why DeSantis. We you find that when voting numbers are down, Republicans win. When voting numbers are up, Democrats win. And that's right. the whole thing is people aren't voting. People are apathetic, and that the that there, there's a shot. Rubio goes oh. down though, or is he going to win? Rubio. That means he's in a race. There, it's just. Weird because she's put all the money into yeah. it. She's busted her ass. Uh, she's the candidate most people like, and yeah. it's close. And I think yeah, Rubio's, Rubio's at some palace in the Cayman Islands there, uh, collecting campaign. money from gun people. Vote. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. Donnie Boyle come out, make an appearance on his behalf. I'm sure. All right, that's coming up next week. That's a week away. A very exciting time, and I think a critical time in American uh, oh, yeah. political and and just uh, history in general. And, uh, you know, look, uh, whatever opinion you have, uh, let's just uh, could we just get some rational people oh, good. to run the country? I, I don't care. Republican, Democrat. I mean, just find me somebody that you can say, well, all right, at least that guy's heart and head is in the right place. Oh, good. And, you know, I may not agree with uh, all of his policies there. I, I don't know that I want to be digging for oil in my backyard, but, uh, you know, and, and completely ignore climate change. Don't get me started. There are a lot of people that believe there's no problem there. It's fucking hot outside, people. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Every year is hotter. It's not. It's fucking right? I mean, it's still 90 degrees last night. I'm schwitzing like a pig. All right. Uh, we, we will see you uh, later on. My, Mike Mayo's lunchbox is going to be from Louis Bossy's in Boca Raton. And that's a great place. Uh, you know what? Very reasonably priced for uh, Boca Raton kind sure of fancy schmancy. Louis Bossy loves Louis. Yeah. I started putting an order in. I'm like, I don't think it works that way. <laughs> yeah. no, I have a lot of great things there, uh, you know, and, and it's kind of casual, although it's chic. It's casual chic, I would say. Yes, yes, yes. yes. But um, Louis Boss is a great guy, and uh, it's an interesting cause uh, because he, he was a full-blown, uh, I believe, uh, like the, the harshest of heroin addicts. Uh, and his wife, and, and they, they came out of that with a recovery and uh, ended up becoming among the more successful restaurateurs here in South Florida with uh, their place yes. on Las Olas was a, just a knockout, man. Hey. Everybody was there. And then they opened the one in Boca, and it's thriving for sure because, uh, you know, good good deals. on You know, I mean, good food at good prices is always going to be an attraction. All right, uh, we'll see you from uh, Louis Bossi's Boca Raton. If you want to come on out there, it's not as fancy schmancy as it sounds, right? Just come on out and have a good time. Uh, Mike May will be out there. And uh, no doubt, I don't know, how much time is he going to spend talking about those scores he made over the weekend? Uh, the first 10 minutes. All right. Uh, you know, and, and he's entitled because, uh, you know what, we're coming up on the Breeders' Cup and uh, a lot of good things. I don't know if he has money on the series or anything. Imagine this. I'm living and dying now with FIU football. I, we have I'm to like, get this coach on the show, man. He is a very, the most enthusiastic guy I've ever seen take a job. What's his name? Is it McKenzie or something like that? Mike. Oh, no, I can't remember his name. Yeah, I, I don't even know his name. I get forgot. him on the show, though. I mean, it can't be that hard to get. Two big uh, wins uh, in a row for this guy. No, well, no, they lost, uh, but they covered a spread. Should I bring that up, that they covered a 30-point spread uh, that we're getting against uh, Mike, Texas Mike, San Antonio? Mike McIntyre? Mike McIntyre? I knew it was something like that. 
That's him. Yeah, I, I think he would be an interesting guy to speak to. And, and they're playing in front of four people. I mean, it's the worst crowd I've ever seen at a sporting event, ever. It's Mike McIntyre. You could go out in the boondocks and go to a T-ball game in a town with a population of like 18. And there'd be more people in the stands at that game than there are for these uh, FIU games where, where they have like a new refurbished stadium. And, you know, I mean, they seem to be taking this uh, thing seriously. Yeah, but they, they brought this guy in. I've never heard a more enthusiastic guy. And I mean, I mean, with all the coach blather we've listened to over the years, this was, I mean, pie in the sky type of stuff that, uh, you know, it was infectious. It really was his enthusiasm. Obviously, he hasn't caught on with the fans yet. But a thrilling victory last week over Louisiana Tech. Louisiana Drek it was. I mean, they were like two and five coming into this ball game, and they're favored by six on the road against a team with a winning record. I think they're like four and four now. They might be uh, FIU. All right, we'll see you later on on uh, Mike Banner's Lunchbox, 12 o'clock. Boca Raton, Louis Bossy, uh, right there on Federal Highway. Great spot. So come on out and say hello uh, from Mike Luby Lubitz. It's only women that are after Mayo that come out. Have you noticed that? Yeah, oh, Andy came out to uh, Pepe's. That, that was just last week. That was a lot of fun on uh, Friday. I will uh, see you next time as we leave another that. The time. It's 9-11. Let's go to eat a damn snack. Look what they've done to my soul.